Hello, hello. We are live. We are live. How is everybody doing? Hello, Zal. Good morning. Is that 6 or 7 a.m. in uh, Singapore? Something like that. I always forget. Singapore is before Tokyo, right? You guys are an hour ahead of Tokyo. Do I have that correctly? Hey, John, how are you? Mike, how's it going over there? I know you're in the weeds, probably. <laughs> Sneaking around. Joshua, 6 a.m. in Singapore. That's correct. Joe, hello. Oh, yeah. Good times, good times. Wednesday afternoon. It's actually a really nice week here. I think I screwed up something with the YouTube. If you guys saw a comment on there and a... Uh, a slow comment or something on the YouTube thing. I think I, I tried to switch something on and off in the back end. So if your comments look a little delayed, I think I turned it off, but it, it shouldn't be too bad. Um, I was trying to slow down the, the reading part of it, and I think it affects actually how fast you can post, which is, I think I screwed that up. But Chris Cortez says, thank you for all the OPR streams, Mike. You are very welcome. Hope they help. Uh, and many more to come. And we're going to probably start a, a new chapter on them um, today, actually. Uh, Tokyo 7, yeah. So Singapore 6, Tokyo 7. Uh, but in the uh, Asian Pacific time zone region, the Tokyo is like the major. So that's why I use it to list it out. Because that way I know you know what Tokyo is. And then I know my Australian, New Zealand guys know what Tokyo time is. So that's why I put that up there. But I always forget. Because <laughs> there's people everywhere. Paul Dito, how are you? Hello from Kansas. Years ago, Paul, uh, let's see. Let's say 1994, 95. Uh, Mr. Rinaldi was a wee lad, uh, not building the models yet, uh, but I was a uh, pretty solid draftsman. I was trying to figure out what to do with myself. This before the art, art center and car design. I uh, was just it stopped going to Cal State Long Beach, um, but I had a pretty long history of being a draftsman, and I worked for a really nice gentleman, Dwight Bennett, who was a, a Kansas State alum architect, fairly well known. Dwight Bennett uh, designed a lot of buildings inside of Long Beach, California, LA area. And I worked as a draftsman for him. And he was a, a big Kansas man. We were big college football guys. And uh, every time I see Kansas, I always think of Kansas football. You know, Bill Snyder and Kansas State and all that. So I hope uh, University of Kansas uh, can compete a little bit higher. Question, wasting time, waiting for my blending brushes to dry. Use multiple, yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's one of the things too, John, is is you uh, you know really through the through the time of moving forward and, and developing and growing the, the tools and stuff. You know, I what I tend to do is is always have two or three really really nice blending brushes in terms of the number twos, so you have a good sharp one, and then you have a couple of your flat ones, a couple of your angles, your fills. Your and we're going to talk about brushes today. So a lot a lot has happened last. Uh, I received a big package yesterday, so there's a lot of conversation going to happen about brushes, different types of brush tips. Uh, a lot of them are useful for blending in multiple scenarios, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. But yeah, I'd always have a you know build that up over time. Um, every every if you're doing a lot of modeling, guys, if you're say say like uh, every three four months, every six months, I, I I just buy a couple brushes on the fly, so you've always got some fresh kind of rotation, just getting the habit. Of it. Morning, uh, Mr. Nong, how are you? Joe, I saw you there. Nice Tiger One. Hello from San Diego, Schubert Sebastian. I don't know why I thought you were in Germany, Sebastian. <laughs> don't ask me. Brian Matthews, hello. Wayne Beatty, I see you. Sayanova, 2008. Hey, Mike. Hello, buddy. How are you? Sayanova, is that right? Sayanova, am I saying that correctly? Uh, Joshua Schickles, yep, I saw you up there. Matt Bryan, saw you. Uh, friend, friend Carello, 29. Paris says hello. Bonsoir, mon ami. Marino, how are you? Lee Goodgen. Hey, Mike. Sorry I missed the last few episodes. It's all good, brother. We're still here. We're just waiting for you to show up, Lee. We haven't really done anything in four weeks, so whenever last time you're... I'm kidding. Sino was in Virginia. That's right. You're uh, Vivian in Virginia. That's what it was. Uh, well, I wish I could get some brushes in the UK. So, to that question, because uh, you're not the first one to ask me that this week, Brian, I do believe King Art Ships International. And I think somebody had mentioned in Australia they received their package. I don't know if it was a Clinton. Hello, 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 Christian. How are you, buddy? Oh, I forget. 
somebody around the world had received something from somewhere from King Art. So I do believe they do have at least respectable international shipping. Uh, however, your little island in the North Atlantic, let me tell you, you guys have really screwed the whole pooch up with the Brexit thing. So not to be a dick, but it's a mess. So shipping's not my fault. <laughs> like we're having trouble just dealing with it too from our, from the scale model industry. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a headache. Uh, I just can't imagine what it's, I know from some of my Irish customers as well, it's a bit of a headache just getting stuff from south to north inside the UK. So it's a bit of a mess. I'm, I'm hoping things kind of, as we roll into the end of this year, that, that those companies and those the bigger ones that kind of control a lot of this conversation start to mellow this all out for us because it is it is a real headache behind the scenes. By the way, King Art had made me rate the transaction. A bunch of reviews mentioned OPR. <laughs> yes, Joe. So that is that is why you're seeing this here right below on stream. Um, it is it is it is because of what's gone on. That's what I, I, I started this off as kind of like lightheartedly joking about it, so to speak, because uh, I'm familiar with the art world in terms of their large companies and they're hard to get a hold of and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, but but because of the review process, because of the modern day shopping process and everything, you guys have made them aware of what's going on along with the purchasing of, of their stuff, which is fantastic. And so um, they've, they've perked up and noticed. And, and so I've got some new stuff here to, to go over with you guys to start to stream off with. Uh, in fact, if you are keen and notice in the description, I have put a whole new list of oil paints up because I started using some last night. That makes a lot of sense, Mike, given and given your position in the world of what you're of who you talk to and everything. Um, and from what I'm hearing from other people in and around both Michigan and uh, in Florida, in California, in, in Georgia, uh, I have kind of feelers out everywhere. Plus what's going on in Europe through the Suez, all the shipping conversation is you're starting to all see it now on your end as a customer. You're going to see price hikes. Uh, it's affecting us at the core. It is like I was kind of complaining about last stream and not the bitch and moan about it, but it is actually kind of true. Uh, you're going to see price hikes across for basically every business out there, whatever it is, scale models and otherwise. <laughs> you know what, Chris, they call me like three times a day from various phone numbers and I block every single one of them, but the sneaky little bastards switch your phone numbers up and they call me and they go, and, and I have to explain to them that I have a 35 year old car, two of them, in fact. So your extended warranty conversation can, you know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there is uh, so reasonable shipping is probably, you know, if you can get an order into the UK for a lightweight, because thankfully brushes are fairly light, um, you know, for under 20 us, maybe that's, you know, 10, 15 quid, 20 pounds, whatever the cost is, you know, that's probably going to be a fair price to be truth be told. Um, but yeah, it is it is going to start affecting us through the Christmas season. You're going to see shipping prices as customers for almost every area of planet Earth. Uh, <laughs> at least 20 minutes. You know, so just just the sidebar because Chris Babs is, is having a funny. He's making a funny here. Um, it's true, though, because in the U.S. we get blistered, blasted with blasted with phone calls to extend our car warranties. But apparently they don't know that you have a new car, an old car. They don't really care. So they cold call you. Um, it was kind of funny, but my BMW, I put the BMW in the shop. It's getting a, a new master cylinder and stuff like that. So I laugh cause I'm like, Hey, I'll take that 20 minute extended warranty right now. But yeah. Uh, relatable Corey, yo at work, still off soon. Like Arnold, I'll be back. Yeah. We'll see you soon, buddy. We'll be here for a while. It's three o'clock. We'll probably roll till six, 9 PM your time. Timothy. Hello. How are you? And hello, Chris. I miss you, buddy. How you doing? Uh, hung out with you guys last night for a good hour or so. Listen to the shenanigans. You want in Kodakai? Paul and the boys. Julio. No one is poo poo on the choo choo. Uh, yeah, I could probably roll into this though right now. I'll wait till Mr. Diesel truck rolls by. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so Zach from uh, Galactic Toys, Chris, had popped in stream, I think it was two Sundays ago. Uh, in fact, he actually put an order in for RSP, so Galactic Toys will be carrying uh, the books in the future, which is which is really nice of them. I'm super happy. But we he confirmed that, that same numbers. Uh, and just so you know, guys, just so you know, like what companies like RSP uh, face, we print in Europe, and we obviously have to get our product back in the U.S. for North American distribution and stuff like that. But we use what's called an LTL shipment. Uh, those of you in the freight world, or you've done this before, you obviously know what an LTL is. Uh, and there's two ways to do this. And we're talking the truck containers or the boat containers, uh, either by rail or by, by sea. Um, and LTL is a less than full load. LTL, that's what that means. Uh, and because I only can fill up so much of a container, uh, I do a partial. 
and they charge you by that. And so my LTLs are way more expensive on a per pallet basis. But what's happening is if you bought the whole container and we're shipping that around the world to say like, for example, like Andy's Hobby Headquarters, you guys are familiar with him. He'll get a delivery from MBK in Germany, full container dropped off in Arizona. And that costs X number of dollars. It used to be around three to $5,000 per container. That's now $40,000, around 30 plus thousand dollars. And for guys like me, who was probably 1,500 to 2,000, a shipment of books, about a ton, a couple pallets worth of heavy books. Um, it's about $10,000 for us. And it used to be about 1,500, 2,000. So like, I can't even do it. I can't even agree to pay those kind of numbers. So we're looking at alternates, but it's it's affecting businesses. And I'm, that's what I'm pissed off about because it's, it's affects everybody. Anybody that running a business is it's just bullshit with this whole, and they are holding, and what Mike's saying above is, and that was kind of my, I joke about it being a mafia, but I've always thought surface freight in particular with, with the unions and, and, and the, um, the longshoremen and stuff like that, they're real heavy handed. Uh, yeah, there's movie implications and conspiracy theories, but there is a little bit of that. I would imagine there's a bit of that overtone to be truthful. Um, so Paul Moser says shipping to the UK FedEx was $20, so about 15 pounds, which I guess for an no, that's actually really good. That's a pretty solid price. But quite a, yeah, and that's what I would do is I would. And the other thing you guys can do too is if, if you're, you know, if you if you do work well together as, as humans, maybe buddy up an order or two. Use use your clubs, your, your your model clubs, and buddy up into a single order. Put a big order in through their through their pages and stuff. And we'll talk about other alternates to the number twos because uh, they do have some um, that are going to be useful for this. Stuff. Uh, books are too cheap anyway. Hit the like button. Where's my boy Matt fifty eight? I haven't seen him. Yeah, hit that like button, guys. Smash it. <laughs> Uh, I cracked myself out. I'm in a good mood today. It's some good shit happening. Uh, regardless of shipping conversation, um, you know, planet Earth will figure its shit out. Um, you know, just football's back on fall. The temperatures are dropping. We're going to get some rain here for people that are fighting the fires and all that shit. So uh, pretty stoked about that. Just the mood's changing. Leaves are turning. You know, I'm a fan. I'm a fan, my friends. Uh, in the 24-pack King R set, is there a good dust color? That is probably the weak part of that set, Chris Cortez, and I will show you what I did with that uh, last night and today. Uh, you'll you'll have to be a little bit more proficient with, with mixing colors, but it's not difficult at all. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple, but that is, that is some things um, to mention, and we'll talk about it. Um, but yeah, thank you, Chris. It's always, always good to have you around, too. Um, oh, I did get, you know, Mr. Pabs. I know you guys aren't the water-based acrylic dudes, but if you get, and I don't know who's in the know or not, um, but along with the King Art, I did get another package, and I get these on occasion too, but they have new colors, but this is for Mr. Chris Pabs, the one and only. It is a beautiful lavender. Uh, they've also got a transparent blue but this one too there's a really nice french cobalt blue too so actually volks um had talked to mission models a while back and it, it coordinated colors with them a little bit so they do have some more specific uh gundam uh mecha colors uh, which is kind of nice even though i know you're a lacquer boy uh, it's still exciting news for those <clears throat> and i do plan to do the, the painting demo so what we're doing hey joshua how are you buddy good to see you need some soda to keep people in their houses <laughs> i bet you do Robert, hello from Poland. How you doing? Um, yeah, good delivery price. But yeah, I was going to say to the shipping thing. So anything like non-heavy, like my books are heavy. I understand that. I have to deal with that. That's actually why the SM books are, and we've talked about that before. The SM books are size for shipping, but the tank art books at a kilo a piece. And I misquoted myself. I was saying two kilos in the last stream. They are one kilo each, two pounds each. Uh, and that's the threshold for like when the prices jump, jump with everybody. And that includes U.S. Post Office and everybody else. Um, yeah, King Art has stepped up. They have contacted me, and I will repeat that story. Um, and right now, we're just we're just kind of talking to each other. Nothing's happened, um, but it is something. I'm, I think there's going to be some potential uh, stuff for for Rinaldi Studio Press in the future. Whether it's just a, a code for you guys to buy at a discount, you know, an affiliate program or something. That's right. They're even more in depth than that. So, um, again, Loa Cornell, these dudes here. Um, this company no longer exists, but the Cornell is king art and so that's where that that connection happens from and so that's why the number two is that we've been really you know hammering home um here we'll go ahead and switch out we'll get into this guys we'll get going and thank you for hanging out with me guys mike your vintage taco bell t-shirt makes me crave a taco light sadly not on the menu anymore did you right um you know is it a sandwich is it a taco commercial you know it's kind of cute it's kind of old already <laughs> move on um Good morning from the New Zealand. Yeah, all my Kiwi friends, all my Australian friends, good morning on your Thursday. I saw you there, Nog, earlier. Um, good to see you guys. 
Uh, what else? Did I make sure? Who do I see? Paul? Yeah, well, I didn't say hello to Paul Moser, but hello. Um, and then what else? We got Scotty Scale Studio. Yep. Okay, so what has kind of uh, happened here in the last 48 hours for me was, uh, so they reached out and they said, hey, you know, thank you. Um, and that thank you from my end, in my perspective, was it's a thank you to you guys. Truth be told, and I say this humbly, you're the ones that purchased the shit. <laughs> I mean, I buy five or six at a time. It's no big deal. It's a $50 order, whatever it is. They don't care. But you guys have sold them out. So uh, they've noticed that. You've given the good reviews, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Mr. Cornell had reached out to me directly via Instagram a couple weeks ago. Um, and he, as a thank you, he said, here's a couple extra stuff for you guys. No, Boz, you are correct. We can sleep when we're dead. Um, I like to set my reminders at 14 minutes late. To remind me. It's okay, Panzer Dan. You know, you guys know, I always take 15, 20 minutes to roll in slow. Um, but I always like to have an opening conversation with you guys. It's, you know, we'll get into the subject matter today. Um, and again, I think I was, I got cut myself off was, we're in the finishing phases of a few of these projects. And so you're gonna see heavy weathering as the focus of the topic of the demos, just because we're trying to get them through and get them done. Uh, we've got some Gundam weapons we're done. I had a little bit more work with some kind of heat discoloration on, on the heat sword thing that we're kind of working with for the dom uh we i did some more real work i posted that up on instagram in the stories uh, yesterday i think it was um because i was watching monday night football and the single greatest thing that has happened on planet earth if you are not aware is the peyton and eli manning show on espn2 for monday night football was was absolutely fucking brilliant it was like a live stream with the best football minds on planet earth watching the game and it was hilarious it was two brothers going at it and it, like if you guys aren't into that and i know some of you guys probably aren't even football fans but it was absolutely absolutely fantastic hi mike xavier xavier ruiz from spain hola amigo so i was watching my monday night football ravens raiders actually a good game two teams i hate <laughs> well i don't really hate the raiders but i'm a Steeler fan so i gotta hate the, the ravens by default so my baltimore boys i'm sorry um, but I do love uh, Lamar Jackson. He's a hell of an athlete and good kid too. But they had Ray Lewis on. They had uh, uh, Kelsey from the Chiefs on. They had uh, Russell Wilson on for like an hour. The last, uh, Rick, hello, how are you? The Man Show was, yeah, dude, the Manning Show was awesome. If you guys are not into this yet at all, or I don't know, it was just a really cool thing because I put on the background and t you know how like brothers go at it? it it's, dude, it's just, and, and Eli and Peyton have this way about him. <laughs> It's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So definitely check that out if you guys are, you know, NFL fans of any of any level. Because um, you have all the regular shows on Sunday anyway to get if you just need regular commentary. But the Monday Night Football was great. So King Art, Mr. Cornell, uh, gentlemen, they are. So they are just a little bit of, I know a little bit about them. I don't know a ton. Um, they're based in New York. And, and their slogan is, I believe, um, made in New York or, or from or designed in New York, made in the around the world. So what they do very cleverly, uh, which I've kind of embraced myself because I print in Europe and stuff like that, is they get all their stuff manufactured in various regions around the world. So the price point, if you guys haven't noticed, I start off with this guy here. This is 24 colors and they're in the 12 mil, which I like because we can't use the big 37s and the 20s very often. So these are, these are 12 milliliters uh, in the fluid uh, conversation, but um, 24 colors, I would say of which 20 of them are actually pretty much one-to-one -one what we're doing. There's about four of them, they're kind of, well, I could probably tweak them a little bit anyway. Um, this set retails for $24.99 US, that's $25. It's on sale half price and or right now as of today, $17. That's 20, dude, this is, this is stupid. When one bottle of oil costs five to $7 at most of the, uh, the quote unquote, the art store. And if you buy heavy duty artist oils, in the 37 to the bigger tubes, those are those are 25, 30 dollars a piece. So this is 24 tubes for 25 bucks. I mean, we always talk about prices stuff. It's important. I, I do get it. Um, outstanding value. And and I've I've got the palette set up. So this is this is I put the link in the description. I would just grab them to have these guys. Just f and grab it. And you know what? Sell them out. Just be hilarious. But um, fantastic quality. I'm really happy with this. Um, I put them in last night and here's here's the colors that come in again we'll go over this one-to-one -one when we get going so i'll be a little bit today I'll be a little bit in the conversation of what king art's starting to do they're a relatively new company to the um, conversation um, but they have kind of said hey thank you it's a thank you to you guys um because it is you guys that are actually buying this shit that's really you know they're making them notice and so um it's a great correlation of between myself you guys and then what they're trying to do so i do appreciate that 
uh, and they don't know much about what we do. They don't, you know, this is this is not an AK or ammo conversation. All <laughs> these are these are art dudes. So, uh, you know, if you look at their Instagram stream, it's it's people painting watercolor flowers and stuff like that, which is which is totally cool. Uh, and I'm actually formally trained in watercolor and some other stuff too. I've, I didn't really, I was shopping around a little bit last night on their on their thing and just looking at some other stuff a little bit closer. Um, I did buy a T-shirt because you got to pimp the swag. Um, and I did buy their pencil set. So they sent me the oil paints and some brushes. They sent me a lot of brushes, uh, which is mostly what they sent. So, but they did send me the, the, the pack of oil paints and then they sent me this little organizer. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, I didn't check the price on this. This might be a dollar, but this little dude, I've got it up over here, um, right there, right next to my coffee cup there where all those brushes are on the left there. Um, kind of never really, you know, I just use kind of found items for my sto storage on my desk. I kind of like the look of kind of a, um, of a whatever. So we'll, we'll kind of, you know, I was like, well, I'll put it together. Honestly, dude, these little things are great. I mean, I, I can't complain. You know, they sent it to me. I'm like, okay, dude, I got all my brushes out. Boom. I'm like, gosh, that was like, why didn't I ever do this like a thousand years ago? And I know there's like Hobby Mio and some others. Obviously there's a bunch of dedicated skill modeling, desktop accessory stuff. So just, you know, whatever. This is just an alternate solution. Uh, a lot cheaper though, by the way. <laughs> um, maybe it's not the cool laser cut wood, but you know, the, yeah, the conversations are early, my friends. Um, they are artists, these are their artists pro grade. So these are, as a, these, this is the thing, and you can read their reviews on their sites regarding their oil paint sets. They are shockingly high quality, like for the price. As a guy who's bought oil paints for most of my adult life over time, um, they are even below a student price. Uh, but they are the pro artist level quality and it's suit their superb, superb, if I can speak. So anyway, that's the latest news with that. That's the oil paints. So let's talk about brushes. I'm going to get my Jimmy Jams over here. And I do like the black and gold because that is a colorway I use up on the website. So I was pretty happy about that too. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's some, I mean, there's obvious ways to go with this, but we'll see. Yeah, Matt Hill, as an Australian, I actually love NFL. Even played here for a few years. Nice. Go Chiefs, Brian. Yeah, that was a hell of a comeback, dude. Um, and it helped me because I'm, a, like I said, an NFC North guy. So uh, the Browns lost. Even though the Browns, I think, are a legit, really, really good team. And, and whoever was arguing with me about the Cowboys, Cowboys played well Thursday night with against the Bucs. I think, that, I think was, if they stay healthy, the Cowboys will be a tough team to play. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have a lot of ideas to talk about guys. You guys are obviously hitting the points and I like I haven't had a formal conversation in terms of you know Whether we can do some sort of affiliate program, you know put something together But my goal is to at least you know move that conversation forward um, But if anything even even at a lack of all other perks benefits bonuses for the prices They charge in their sale you and they have sales all the time all the time You know, they're very much like uh, just a general retail outlet. So they're always running good prices So it's a it's a get on their newsletter um, their Labor Day 50% off sale was, I mean, it's, I think the, like I said, the paint set was $13 over the weekend, over the holiday weekend. It's 17 right now. It's normally retails at $25. Even their bigger sets, their, their larger sets are not expensive at all. So, uh, really, really good prices. Um, and from what I can tell, the quality is holding up. So, cause I would know right away if the, if the oil paints, so I did a bunch of work on the Stug last night and, uh, with their oil paints, I swapped them all out. I put a new cardboard palette together. But what we've got here, let me, so this is kind of my, these are my normal ones here, these guys here. Okay, let's go through some of these here, so, and I'll show them on screen. I, I'm not going to list them out on the, on the description. These are just, this is just kind of showcasing you some of this stuff. So the Filbert, and these are all art names, by the way, too. So the, the Filbert is kind of our, our flat rake with a slightly curved tip to it. It's not a, it's not a cut straight across. Um, it's, it's you rotate that and you get that thin tip, but it goes wide this way. So the, I tend to call all these rakes myself. There's there's a number of various versions of rakes and fans. The fans would be like this. This is your typical fan brush, um, and this this is useful for certain types of streaking. I wouldn't I don't use these kind of very often. In fact, I've only ever had one or two fans. Um, but again, you, they don't really go thin as well as you'd like, but they do go really. So there's some cool effects you can get with this, um, and I go for all the smaller sizes just because. In the art world, a lot of it's for large 2D canvas paintings. So try to go on the on your smaller sizes, and they're going to be a little bit. You just have to kind of learn what's what. There's really no correlation like what a number two means versus what does a 10 O mean. You know, like why why is my number two? Like I've never really understood that. Like it, the size to me doesn't make a ton of sense. Even though I kind of get you know you just go by like I need number twos or I need a 10 O fan. 
Um, because a 10-0 in another thing is I think they sent me a 5-0. So this is what I'm talking about here. And I'm sure it, it, I can get some information out of it. This one, okay, it won't come off. Here's a 10. So this is what I'm talking about. So here we have the your your fine. Uh, here's the middle one's a 10-0. The fan's a 10 but there's no correlation to size to me. It doesn't make any sense to me. But I don't, I mean, that's just how it is. And then here's a 5 -0. We pull that out of the way. So this 5 is on the bottom and a 10 is up top. So I'm going to guess there's some reason why one's longer than the other. Um, but for detail painting work, for figure painting work, stuff like that, um, very, very small, fine detail work in terms of the painting side of the conversation. Um, I don't really see a need to use these comparatively in the OPR conversation. You can. If you can't find the number twos and grab a couple of these, these 10 O's, they just don't have quite the belly at the base of the bristles to kind of hold more liquid. So it's a little bit of a compromise, but you do get the sharp tip. Um, so that's the two. The two is the one, two, they're currently sold out. And in fact, they're, they're um, that's the one thing I want to talk to them is see if they can really up production. So they at least have a lot of, of, of number twos on hand because it's going to be um, again, to the it, it's kind of a, a weird. I never really tried to. I wasn't trying to be. I wasn't. I'm not an influencer. I don't consider myself an influencer. But you guys respond, so it's that's what happens. That's how customers work. That's how the modern shopping thing works. So, um, so they've sent me these. Uh, I'll save the last. I'll save this other one for, for for the end here. But there's there's one that kind of cracked me up, and you guys will know what I mean when I get to it. So there's another type here. Where is my heritage right here? So the other type of thing you guys want to start paying attention to uh, are the mop brushes. And the mop brushes are gonna be really, really nice for stippling. Uh, so what I, what I tend to do is I talk about these guys, which is, I'll go into order here of new to use and then the, what the mop is. So they call this, it is, they call it an angle shader. Um, French guy says, go Saints, of course he does. Of course he does, because all your Cajun friends are in Louisiana. Um, so the, they, I'd actually like, like if I was to have that conversation with them, you know, I'd maybe change the name to a blender because blender is what, how we talk about things of blending the effects out. But a shader is kind of the same concept, same idea. So this is the new one on the right, right here. This is their eighth inch one, the one over eight's eighth of an inch. Uh, and then this is my old Jimmy Jam that I've worn out, which is you take this guy and you just start kind of crushing on the table a little bit, be a little bit more rough with it. It'll turn into the middle guy here. And then that's, you have like a balance of new versus old. So you can blend in various forms and styles. But you can see the middle one here by my finger with the green tint on it from, from last night. Uh, this mop brush here next to it, it's a little bit bigger, but the tip area, the brush tip area, uh, have very, very similar qualities. So these, these, um, I haven't really used them before until last night at any kind of length, uh, but the mini mop in one eighth as well, this brush here. So look for that in, in, in the brushes if you guys need some additional purchasing. Also, these guys are fantastic. I definitely second to the number twos are going to be these guys. And this, the quarter inch size, and there's an eighth inch size. I think that I, I think I got an eighth inch one. Did I not pull it out? I think it's this guy. Yep, here we go. Yeah, so this is the, the grass rake. So they, the grass combs. So they call them grass combs. I call this like a flat rake myself because it's just, it's just trimmed straight and flat uh, and you can turn it thin. These are useful because you get that broad, like if you need that blend this way, but you can also turn it this way for that blend. And then you have a smaller version of basically identical thing. Um, I would use these mostly for blending, um, but these are what they call the flat grass comb. Kind of a pimp name if you ask me. Uh, but the one eighth and the one fourth, I would say go heavy on the quarters, get two or three of these for sure. Keep one of them really pristine. There's always a last final streak effect sometimes that I'm almost always pulling in this guy. Um, and then there's another one, I, this one's in the lower Cornell thing, but it's this guy here. I think this one's different. It's the fill break, and this is the other style. I don't have a, a King Art one of this, but I have the older Loa Cornell one. But the fill break is a very similar brush, but slightly, slightly different. It's a little bit, I think what they're calling, um, where did I throw that dude down at? Did I just lose him? It's this guy. So they're straight up, yeah, so there's a filbert and a fill break. So what I believe King Art has transferred the name to, the filbert over here, the one I showed a little bit earlier, it's got the slightly rounded tip to that. It's a little bit slightly slight around. This is flat and then this guy's a bigger version of this guy. So all of these rakes are really helpful for the vertical street blending conversation. So have, look for a fill break, the flat grass comb and or the filbert uh, as they call it. And then you can you can throw in one of these guys too if you want some other kind of just a, a just what do they call this one? A bristle fan. So I just call them the fan. The, 
I think Mr. Bob Ross used a lot of fans in his day. So the mops are good. This is, this is an, they call this one the oval mop. This is a little bit bigger. Uh, also good for dusting, for cleaning, you know, for especially for, for display models. The mops are almost like a makeup brush, which is probably where um, they sent me a large pack of them. I have some bigger ones here. So I probably use these mostly for dusting my models off, keeping them clean. I don't really have a need for something quite this size. I think most of us don't, uh, but they just sent it to me anyway, which I'm sure they're just, you know, here you go, um, which is fine. Because uh, I could use, good dusting brushes are good. Yeah, and that's, and that's probably what you're gonna start seeing as you guys start going through this. The mini mops, the flat grass, um, everything in the small size is the 1 8th, the 10 0s, the 5 0s. You guys are probably gonna start buying up in quantities and I just recommend getting two or three of everything on the sale prices. Um, hey George, how are you? That's kind of where I'd go with this for right now until I have any other news or any other information, which will be for a while. So for now, just you know, focus on these. That gives you a really good overall brush. Like right here, uh, it's probably more than I would use, but I have options for certain things. I think one, which one did I not? I didn't talk about this guy. This is uh, a Crescent Filbert. So again, the Philbs, the Filberts, the grasses, the combs, uh, this one might be a good dry brushing a little bit larger scale. And one thing I will talk about moving forward, not tonight or anything like that, but uh, in the future, uh, is moving into some large scales and how you approach a larger scale, like a 30 second scale or a 16 scale, basically by bumping your brush sizes up. So there are, you know, again, this is a great resource. We're actually really, really lucky that this resource exists because one thing in the back of my mind earlier this year was I was hearing the rumblings you guys were saying, hey, that I can't find the lower Cornells, the number twos anywhere. And I was kind of like, okay, this sucks. Now what do I do? And I hadn't really, because I have a bunch of them. So I'm like, I haven't really put the time in to go find more. So you guys found these and then all of a sudden they happen to be, and so it's this whole thing. Yeah, so so Joe says, five, O is the size and five, are, that would make sense. That makes a lot of sense to me and um, how it correlates to, so this is probably why this is a 10-0. Um, and I'm guessing the 10 this guy here, you know the length and i'm gonna guess that's actually a millimeter hold on here let me see if we can put this together i probably should know all this stuff and stew it into it yeah so I'm, that's probably a 10 mil bristle length which is looks about right so i'm guessing a 5.0 is probably a five millimeter bristle length and that's probably the you know we have one over eight with this i used to think a one over eight and one over four and they're like no no that's one eighth of an inch dude I'm like, oh sorry it just made me feel stupid, but, you know, where'd you go? There we go. Okay, yeah, so there's there's the 5.0, which is, that's right at 5 mil. So, and then put the 10 mil up on the screen. It's a little bit longer than a 10 mil, but that's probably, it's about 12. Okay, but that makes sense, though. So that's, but it's, you know, I don't use those small brushes that much, and I know figure painters probably would. Uh, George says he's late, late to the game today. You're fine. Um, and did you use King Art for hand brushing as well beyond? Yes, absolutely. So these are just physically brushes. Um, and they actually have all sorts of, uh, they have a high, this is kind of their mid-level range, to be honest with you. Um, the type of work we do, at least what I'm talking about, at least what, you know, the RSP thing and OPR and all that kind of stuff. Weathering scale models, these kind of, these brushes here are um, a good value performance ratio. Um, you know, you're looking at four or five bucks each on, on average, maybe six to seven bucks for the bigger ones. Um, you buy 30, 40, and these, these will last, you know, this type of collection of brushes. They sent me like four or five new number twos. They sent me a variety, so they didn't send me like 20 number twos that you guys can't, like only sent me a couple of everything um, just to try out. But I think uh, he tried to pick out selections going off the videos. He was watching us do our stuff. Uh, that's kind of what happened. You know, they kind of said, hey, look at what you're doing. Hey, hello, Omnipla, how are you? How is uh, South Korea today? So that's kind of what happened. And, um, it's a good kind of just a refresh on this. Um, you can go back through the video and kind of stop and pause and check stuff out if I was going a little fast for you guys. I have just the links in the description or just the, the number twos and a couple of the fill breaks and, and those things that I'm using. Uh, I'll just put a brush general link up there as well so you guys can tap that. There's an oil paint general. It's just straight to that set. They don't sell the individual tubes as of now. So, and I know off their website, their announcement was that oil paints are relatively new to the conversation. Secondary to that is I don't see any thinners or any matte mediums or any other kind of brush mediums or, or ox galls or any other kind of secondary art accessories painting supplies yet. I'm assuming they're working on it and I haven't talked to them about it. So there's no odorless thinners. You'll have to continue on with the hobby stuff. 
uh, which is totally cool. Um, this is just me giving you guys a heads up on what's going on with this. Uh, if they add anything in terms of, you know, like an odorless thinner or something like that, I'll, 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 you know, let you guys be aware of it. But I would get on their newsletter anyway and all that kind of stuff. Check out their website. Um, it's a nicely run operation. Um, and I think the price value relationship of what's going on. Um, I haven't, I'm not, I don't use anything from ammo, just so everybody's clear. I've never really, the ammo conversation happened after um, I've got most of the bulk of my AK stuff, my 502 stuff. And then I was, I've been on the lower Cornells for 20 years. Like I've been using these. Uh, when I sent them my email, I had to go back to my first models of stuff. I was, I've been using these brushes as my go-to because AK and ammo brushes came into the conversation way late and they're just, re, they're just private labeled brushes anyway. So it's not like their brushes are special. And the brush conversation is huge in terms of global brush availability. Our brushes are just, they're everywhere. So I wasn't really super concerned about, you know, whether they have a brush. If you have, if you need a Sable or a Kalinske or something like that for, then you just go to the store and pick out a really nice, you know, go to the art store and pick out a really nice one or two sables because you can keep a sable for years, years and years and years. They don't go through the abuse of what we do with this stuff, uh, which is why you want a little bit more of a price point conscious one. I've not used Weber's stuff, no. Um, the only, only art brand that I've ever really used to any extent past anything was always Windsor Newton. Um, yeah, and that's the thing is I had most of my early art days, my art training stuff, most of the stuff that was pushed on us at least in the California region of where I was at school and everything like that. Um, yeah, and, and, and so Joe's talking about, and the other one I was going to bring up here, I haven't mentioned yet, but is Gamblin. And Gamblin's a Portland company. So um, I had actually had, had, had initially had conversations with Gamblin about doing some stuff with RSP and everything like that. But um, I don't have any, I haven't actually gone to the store or purchased anything online in terms of replacement odor listening, mainly because I've been using the AK stuff for a lot, for a while, and it works perfectly well. There's, you know, I haven't had a need to, to buy other stuff. Um, so, but yeah, I did want to give the King, because the, cause the thing with the King Art one, that box of 24, like that's a, that's honestly a great starter set. And outside of the, the dust color, not having like a pure dust, they have kind of a flesh tone, but they don't really have like a tan or a beige in the set, but it's easy to mix from white and, and the, the umbers. So it's not a big deal. Matt Bryan's out of here. We'll catch you at the show. You got it, buddy. Have a good one. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's other, obviously, and there's a ton of obviously art brand options of course for for thinners and stuff so i wasn't super concerned but yeah pretty cool pretty pretty cool and i will definitely keep you guys all abreast of all the the fun stuff but what i do need to do is i do need to pull out some of these here so we can get to work oh wait the last one <laughs> totally forgot matt ran off right before the fun part happened <laughs> you guys will love this one and I don't, I've never used this. I don't know what it does. It's a beautiful bristle. I mean, it's really, really nice. Oh, focus, you stupid camera. Oh, by the way, iPhone 13s. Yep. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do the 13 Pro, I think is what I'm, we're going to switch to. So I'm on the 12 mini, but we're going to get the, the 13 Pro, um, which is which has quite a bit of bump in the uh, optical and, and zoom care. But here we have, my friends, the one stroke. We call this the money brush. <laughs> it's one stroke. You're one and done. Uh, I'll have to research a little bit what they're for. It's a, it's a long bristle. It probably gives you a really nice linear stroke for certain types of effects, kind of like a liner, if you will. It's a, it's basically a flat liner, if that makes sense. It's not quite as thin, but it, you know, it almost, but it looks like it could be useful for some certain, but I just cracked up at the name. Just call it the one stroke, <laughs> which I'm guessing because it's, everything's almost always literal in the art world. It was probably, it's probably a one stroke brush for, for certain uh, final effects like you do the you do the grass like if you're painting grass on canvas it's one stroke you don't want to be you know doing the whole thing but yeah so anyway one stroke yeah dancer's name i cracked up at that one that is the money brush right there we're saving that one for a special day but anywho good times good times all right uh where do i want to start train gun number tank <laughs> not sure what i'm doing I was working on the tank all last night. Uh, sounds like a dancing. Have you ever tried God hand bread? I've not. And so that's what you're. And also the Asia conversations with. Um, yeah, first off, God hand are expensive here in the U.S. We, not many people carry them. So my biggest issue with you know Hobby Mio, uh, God hands, a lot of the stuff. I'm leaning on USA Gundam Store because they're either or, you know either or doing stuff and or probably going to in introduce their own you know Asia source product line from those kind of things. So. Um, usually trying to get a hold of God hand stuff here in the U.S. Has, has always been an expensive proposition. And, and unless they're going to come in at a, at a five to seven dollar, like, and again, this is an OPR conversation. You know, they don't, God hand doesn't know anything about weathering in terms, and I'm not saying that to be derogatory. It's just, that's not their focus. You know, focus is on clean gunpla. So weathering gunpla is a totally different conversation to the God hand conversation. They're probably 
don't have quite the direct correlation yet um, versus say like AK and ammo, if that makes a lot of sense. Uh, how do these brushes stand up to thinners? Do you destroy the brushes over time? Yeah, any, any thinner will, will, will be a destructive process over time, but the odorless thinners are, are probably as close to a non-toxic solvent. Be oh, by the way, those oil paint, what do they do? I did smile, my friends. I did smile. Non-toxic, artist quality. Uh, which is good. That's what it is—a solvent-based conversation, but it is as low as low toxicity as possible, and that actually makes me really happy. So, uh, a good odor, odorless thinner merino uh, won't destroy the brushes per se, even though, in, in terms of like what a white spirit will do, what an enamel thinner will do, they're pretty caustic. They'll they'll, they'll go through they'll chew through brushes pretty fast. Um, yeah, but again, so. To the God hand conversations, I, I don't even know who carries them. You know, is there anybody in the States that carries Sprue Brothers, anybody, Galactic Toys? I mean, I don't even know. So, um, yeah, a chipping brush, I know. I think I've seen some of that stuff. I think my chipping brush was a pair of scissors. I took an old bugger. <laughs> nah. But in, in some of that, that's, that's where you get a little bit. That's my original chipping brush. <laughs> it's a pair of snippers. Bye. And then I've got these guys here. The, the flat rakes. The flat rakes are actually a really, really nice chipping brush if you just need a, a really good chipping brush. Not to saying that theirs doesn't work well or anything like that, but it's just it's probably really tough to get a hold of. Um, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, God, I've, and I've used the God Hand nippers and all. I broke two pairs, so I'm kind of done with the God Hand stuff. I think they're a little bit on the over. Like, you're going to be paying for God Hands. And it's a little bit like the gun primer conversation with the glass files. You know, if you're, you're going to be paying a premium for their name, so just be aware of that. Um, not that they're bad or good, it's just, you know, you pay a premium for some of this stuff. Whereas what I think with the King Art stuff, one thing I like is you don't pay a premium price for a really good product, which is which is a nice way to go. Brush soap, you can use brush soaps. I usually don't, George. Again, I'm not doing a lot of, of technical painting, the weathering stuff, the oils and stuff like that, you know, the cleanup, the, the way I storm. These brushes, so far we've been, I've been using the same brushes for three months on now with streaming twice a week for most of this stuff. I haven't really pulled in any new, couple of new brushes probably five total over over three months so we're, we're doing a good job and that's that shows you how you get a good life out of them but yeah you guys you can you can youtube brush cleaning there's a whole bunch of dudes out there tell you how to clean your brushes like crazy like the they use a really brittle metal merino that's the problem is they, they they snip in a certain direction really really well but if you stress that metal they will snap on you so what usa gundam store did and this is why uh i think it's it, it's an intelligent review of the product um, it's a response on a competitive level. Um, the USA Gundam store nippers probably snip. It's the single side nippers. You get that really thin blade right there. But there, the, the strength of that blade in, in, in uh, is it sheer? What, what is, when it goes the other direction, which, which will fracture metal, uh, is much stronger than the God Hands. And they'll clip at about an 80 to 90% quality level that the God Hands nippers do. So you can get really, really, uh, basically, honestly, for the daily use, for two thirds the price, you get just as good a quality with much more durability. And I've this is my first pair. They're almost a year old now. I think I got these about it what last November, whenever you sent them out. Um, so I think they're better than the Tamiya. The Tamiya has a really nice side cutters too, the single blade ones. Those are $35, $40. God hands are 50, the good God hands are 50, 60, almost $70 now. So this is a 35. I think you get these if you buy, if you're in the Gunpla, blah, blah, blah. blah. Dispays are good. Dispays is probably the new heavyweight. Um, everybody's comparing everything to Dispay, which is fine. Um, but that's a Chinese brand that's come on strong. There's Hobby Mio now. There's a bunch of Asia stuff going on. Like if you guys aren't paying attention in, in the hobby world, the Asian companies and paint, tools, it's blowing up. Um, yeah. So, but the thing with the USA Gundam Store Nippers is that they're American based, which I appreciate. Uh, I have a good relationship with Adam and the team down there. Happy to support them. Um, you know, and, 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 and I'm gonna be really clear with this because I know Walter, you're throwing names out left and right. Um, you know, I'm not a brand sponsor. You know, it's just, that's not what this is. The King Art thing is not that conversation. If, if it goes past this, it's gonna be a partnership just like my mission models. I do because graphic design work for them. So use the brands you guys like. Like, I don't really care, truth be told. I don't care about God. Like, you guys just use what you like. If you get off on what you use and it does what you want, you love them, fucking hey, that's awesome. That's all we care about. I want you guys happy, not me. Don't worry about me. And I'm not, and I'm not one to, to talk down about any real company in terms of like, I'll give you my honest opinion on something, but I'm not, you know, everybody's a business and they're all trying to make money and they're all trying to survive a crazy world right now. So that's what that is. So, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, blame God hands for anything, but it's, you know, you're, you're going to be paying, but it's, you know, you want to drive a Porsche, 
you're paying a premium. So that's what you, that's the same conversation. What else are we doing? We got everything? Okay. To screw it. And we'll go right to the Stug. This guy's a little close. Let me raise this camera up one notch. Because the Stug is up on a little bit of a stand as well. Okay. But that's really the heart of it is really, you know, whatever paint brand you use, whatever tool brand you use, um, you know, even the brushes, whatever they are. I mean, it's all good information. And there's so much out there. It's just, and I guess it's good. You know, skill model hobby is, is, a, is a burgeoning enterprise. Billions of dollars, my friend, out there going on. Yeah. So I use what I use and it's not really me to like tell you how to, how to you know, whether. I, I think you should be a little bit healthier. I, I do think there needs to be a heart to heart on lacquers, uh, to be truthful. But, you know, because I don't want you guys getting, getting the, the bad juice. Um, I think, I think they, they, they probably need to be talked about a little bit more in an honest way, but, uh, yeah, so that's what you saw, Josh, my little brush holder. It's, it's, it's basically, I store everything this way. Come here. Oh, just out of arm's reach. That's how I store everything. Everything's, uh, well, except for the knives are tipped down, but everything I store in these vertical storage things, even, even though I just put this one on my desk, everything I've got is like a cup or some sort of. Got these old Etsy ammunition containers I've had forever um, that I just store stuff in, you know, cups, glasses. Uh, but yeah, you do not store your brushes bristle down, my friends. Don't ever do that. Always bristle up. Um, damage the, yeah, no, whoever told you that, Josh, <laughs> smoking crack. You do not ever want to store your, and why? Because they just bend. You just basically destroy the bristles if you store them down on the bristle tip. Now you can store them down uh, and replace them with the clear protective tube so that tube is, is resting on the tube. You can do that for sure, but um, no, everything's, everything's almost pencils, everything. You store that up. So you can see it, number one, you know, that's, it, I will be truthful too. It's when you're, when you're bristled down, like you're literally hunting for the brush <laughs> and you're already hunting for the brushes is because you got 50 of them over there. I'm like, oh, what, which one, blah, blah, blah. So no, bristle up, dry, and, and then when, um, if you're not going to use them for a while, just a little bit of saliva rotate through the, it gives you a nice sharp tip, tip. And then that way, when you use them next, when you put them, you, you always start them off in the thinner, then you go right to the oils um, and you just use them away. So yeah, it's, don't overthink that stuff, guys. You guys are cracking me up with this shit. Like don't, don't get, don't be dudes with this stuff. It's not cars. It's not a carburetor versus a turbo. This is just the brush. Dude. It's okay. <laughs> Nobody cares. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, I, and I'd say the only other way to be to sort horizontal, you know, I'd use it like lay them down. But, but again, the problem with horizontal and everything else is like I've just said, is if you are, do work a lot, uh, like the workflow conversation, tip down or horizontal, you're just hunting for stuff. So it's always a pain. Okay. Yeah, I'm all, and that's one thing too. If, I, if, if there's anything you can take away from, from Rinaldi, if anything from me, is just, just cut through the bullshit. Workflow, it's, it's about workflow efficiency. Like the whole conversation about photo tents, um, I, I bought into it hard. I got all sorts of photo tents for the years and stuff like that, dude. When you're trying to paint and do S set, SBS step-by-step -step photos for magazines and publications, and you're moving a model from this to the photo tent, this to the photo, F off. Just I just put the white paper on my desk and I just put the camera right here and it's fucking done. It's all about workflow. It's all about efficiency. It's, it's all about getting in the zone. Dude, you gotta get the rhythm. Because if you ain't got the rhythm, you're just a white guy trying to dance and that's just ugly for everybody. Nobody wants to see that, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, no, brush soaps are legit. Yeah, yeah, no brush, saddle soap, brush soaps. Those are, all, yeah, if you if you long, and some people, no no, no, uh, no joke, some people will use their brushes for, for a long, long time. Most of my brushes, I've not bought a bunch of new brushes, like really bought new brushes for a long time. I, I will buy a couple new fresh number twos, but the bulk of my brushes I've had for, for many, many years. So no, you just take good care of them, just like all your tools, guys. All you know, use use the lube and the airbrushes that they give you. It, it makes all that stuff last. Makes the seals, the, everything. It's legit. No, no, it's legit. A gimmick is okay, Meg. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> like the shaders. The shaders are a little bit of gimmick because they're basically inks, but inks are appreciating the post shading. He's putting them in a, in a bit of a thing, but that's you know, what he does. He takes it and makes an art store brand and makes it a military brand, which is totally cool. Um, the oil brushes are a little gimmicky for me. I don't think the mascara thing, it probably helps 5% of the time for, for those that just don't really care about oil paints. 
if you care about oil paints, you're going to have to get the linseed oil out, like in terms of this conversation. And even if it's not OPR or anything, if you're just using oils on a model, even figure painters, and that's where it comes from. By the way, and I think I've said this before, if you're not aware, the oil paint process, the OPR process comes from the figure painters. That's how they get their, their jackets and their fabric to dry dead matte and not glossy for three weeks and then they're matte coating it for forever. Um, yeah. Jimmy Dam, that's right. Okay. So this guy's progressed a little bit from the last time you saw him. Uh, I think what we finished up was right up here. Uh, let me let me back up because I do. I am getting sidetracked. Let's get this. We'll wrap this up so we can move on. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, so on the left is the 502 palette I was using up to last week. Um, colorways are a little bit different in terms of what it is, but basically all these colors over here exist up over here. Um, it's all the same burnt sienna, uh, burnt umbers, raw umbers, blacks. It's all up over here. It's all up over here. They only have the one gray, which is a little bit of a cool gray, which is kind of this gray right here. That's kind of your my dark mud, dark gray colors up over here. So they didn't really have a dark gray color. And then the only real weakness I saw are in the set. And it's understandable because that's, that's not marketed for people like us. Just be honest. It's no big deal. They don't really have any tanner beiges in the set itself. Now, that's not to say they don't make more oils. It's their first product of oil paints that they're starting off with. So I'm sure there'll be more colors. Uh, but they have kind of a fleshy pink tone here. And then there's a yellow ochre, which was kind of the same color, even though this is all worn out. It was this color right here. Um, yellow ochre is kind of basic earth in 502. And then all the yellows, greens, reds, and all that stuff are all basically one-to-one -one with the blues and everything. That's all kind of similar. They didn't have an olive green, but you can make an olive green super fast. Um, and then to make the tans, uh, this is the white over here, which now I have a new white. <laughs> Um, so I do have a new new tube of white. I just mix a little bit of white with the tan uh, or with the browns and you get a little bit of a quick, quick dust color. Uh, and I'll show you how I do that on here because I, I had to do all this last night. So this is working last night on the Stug. You can see kind of my colorways of what I'm doing. I would say the only thing that I was, and I will talk to them about this and, and what their opinion is on it in terms of the company, in terms of like, hey, just by the way, if you're doing colors and need suggestions. Windsor Newtons, uh, I would say have this tube, guys. In, in truth is the three tubes I've used from Windsor Newtons, um, the burnt sienna, which is my rust down here, it is just, there's something, it's magical. There's something about it. This is their, uh, their sienna up here. It's a little bit more of kind of a clay color, kind of an adobe, kind of a brick red color versus what you get out of the, and I'll show you the difference here. And maybe I could probably get a little bit out of that. Um, it's just got a, there's a bit of love that, and, and this might be a really expensive pigment. So that might be why, cause it's also like a $20 tube of oil paint, but it will last 10 years. So I would recommend the Windsor Newtons, the bases ones that I've used forever. And that's why I've used those three colors forever on my models, to be honest with you guys. It's the burnt sienna, burnt umber and raw umber. Those three are staples on my thing, but this is the King art palette. So let's just use it just so you guys can see how it goes. Uh, on hand painted camo hairspray chipping. I haven't done hand painted camo with hairspray chipping. I'm trying to think of what the model was. I did it one time, especially. Problem, okay, so to sidetrack real quick. Um, hello, Forrest, how are you? Uh, what else? Uh, is all this stuff is gimmicky. Yeah, and that's what it is, Joe. That we call gimmicky. I, I actually don't like that word. It's, it's not fair. Um, yes, at times it can be, but the, really the truth and what they're, the core of their companies are to make it as efficient and easy for you guys to enjoy the hobby. That's the purpose of ammo, AK, Vallejo, life, all the expansion sets that they do and the weather and all that stuff. It's, it's, that's what it is. And so I don't want to knock them. I don't think it's fair to knock them. They're they're doing their and you know what their success is is look at look at Tacom, look at you know even Das Work, you know, and those guys what it's like the expansion through the hobby of new kits and new it's man, we can't knock them. Fuck up. It's whatever. It's all good. It's all good. We all do our thing. It's no big deal. Um, but yeah. Uh, so what happens, Sebastian, with hand painting, and I'll get back on point here in a sec, um, is that you're going to reactivate with the direct contact with the brush, the hairspray. So hairspray reacts to the water or, or the thinner, the liquid in, in, the, in the paint. So when you're hand painting on top of a hairspray layer, you're, 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 in, you're physically touching it and it will activate that liquid. Um, and so even though in a dried state, it'll reactivate or re-wet it, it makes it a challenge. The only way around that, Sebastian, because it's just not something I'd really recommend an airbrushing car. It's really for airbrushing, at least in terms of what, what it's all about. Um, and I remember talking to somebody about this where they kind of had worked at it, but it's going to be just you're going to have to practice this to figure out how to do that. You know, you have to really sit down and air, you know, put down a base color, hairspray it and then brush paint over and see what happens and just keep going through that process until you kind of, you know, between you only have a couple variables. How much thinner is in that? 
uh, paint, how much water's going on, and, and the, you, just, you just play with the ratios until you find some sort of happy medium. And what I would say, if you've never done that, is start with like the simplest is like a 50-50 conversation. Make a note of it. Here's my 50-50 thin ratio with the hand brush, and then adjust left or right. You know, go more paint or go more thinner and see what happens. And then that way you've got a barometer to say, okay, when I do this, this is what happens. And that's how you kind of, you're gonna have to solve that methodically like a scientist. You're gonna have to kind of play that out. Um, but that's, that's kind of what I would do. And I, I don't, again, I just don't hand paint. I'm trying to think, in the Machine and Krieger world, the Lincoln Wright style, you know, uh, Kawakiyama, that whole thing. Um, it's, a, it's a slightly different end result. Um, you know what I'm saying? And so, but, you know, Mike, I agree. There's, to me, there's not really nothing wrong with it. Again, I've never really, uh, there might be some personal stuff, but there's nothing like from a business standpoint. Like, I, I think gimmicky's a little bit harsh on them. They're just trying to make a living too, you know, truth at the end of the day. And a lot of those dudes are my buds too, so I can't be like too much of a dick. But, you know, I don't use enamel, thin enamels. It's just not my thing. Cool. No biggie. Plus, they don't smell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would say the patty. And that's, yeah, so you're, it's just going to be a thing, Sebastian. It's going to be something where you're going to have to really sit down. And you guys all know, I mean, if you want to hit the target, you got to go to the range. You know, whether that's a golf club or, you know, whatever it is or whatever you're doing, you got to go to the range. You know, go to the tennis court and just hit the balls because um, that's the only way that's going to go down. And I put that in, the, I, I readjusted the description a little bit too, if you guys noticed, by the way, I, you know, kind of put that up more at the top. I really want you guys to really get that. As winter starts to creep up on us here, it's going to be a good time for many of you above the equator, the north of the equator, because uh, our, our southern boys, they're going to start, you know, surfing and swimming with the sharks. Um, practice, 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 practice. You've got lots of sports to watch, lots of time, hopefully some downtime if you're busy. So... All right, so what had happened here? Let's 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 get into this. Let's get dirty. So this uh, was this hatch. Sorry, my bad. It was this hatch here? So this I believe is a commander hatch here. I think it's a commander. Commander's either here or here. Gunner or commander. It might be loader here. I forget. Uh, maybe that's commander. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this hatch here, uh, I had put a little bit of weathering on this, and we'd kind of had taken it to this little bit of a level. Um, and then what I was talking about at the time was in comparison to the work down on the engine deck and then shifting the tones to a little bit cooler range of colors, uh, less dirt, less grease, less grimy colors, uh, and kind of pushing, uh, this is a little bit warmer tone. You can see kind of the yellowish, kind of reddish tints a little bit, uh, the grease and the grime, and then pushing up here a little bit more. And then what I did is I shifted up and the color on the cameras, it's for, yeah, it's got a, hopefully you can see there's a, like a hint of a greenish blue. You can see it in this panel up here in the front. I pushed it out to see what would happen. Plus, I was playing with some of the, the colors of the, of the King Art oils last night just to kind of play up and see, like, get kind of a coolish Panzer Gray bluish tint through the white just to see how it looks. And I think it's too strong, but I it's fine for now. It's, it's totally cool. You know, it gives a nice little breakup of... But you can see what starts to happen, is particularly with the top of a vehicle that's broken down, paneled out like this. I kind of went back and forth with how much of the white do I do I get rid of because what was what I was looking at a little bit and Stugs are like this. This gets kind of specific to the task now versus a general conversation is even, again this is a dust photo, but you can see the wear patterns on the top of this B model and kind of what's happening. But so what I did was I kind of left the whitewash and kind of did this. So I kind of played I, and I, that's talking about using the references to tell my story without because it's a little bit different look you know the i don't want the white to be worn off of this one as much and mainly because my previous stug in which i do have that information the previous stug three that i did in, in this camo scheme because I, I this is the fourth or fifth one i've done i forget how many now it's it's a, it's a few was a much heavier chip version um final result and so i want to have a different look in my portfolio so I'm actually doing this intentionally because I've done I've done the look a different way, and now I'm doing the same look in in this. Oops, get on the camera here, my friends. Here we go. So you can see up in here. Let me zoom out a little bit so we can kind of compare the two, contrast and compare. And I'm doing this on purpose first, mainly because. So I and I, I'm doing this so you guys can kind of see. I've got a body of work here where this is an older piece for me. So it's same conversation for you. If you're you know whatever you're doing, if you do repeat a few things. This is a much heavier chipped in terms of the starkness of the chips and all that kind of conversation. And this and this one on the table is a lot is a is a totally different look almost. But you can also see the color tone. See how this is a really kind of a well, that's actually before it got really dirty. Let me. Yeah, so here's oops. 
So here's kind of the colorway of the older one. This is the one from 20, 2012, 2013. Um, but just that look, you can see how I was doing that. So that look would exist. So that's what I'm talking about references. You can see it, you can compare it and then kind of pulling it in. And I was kind of using that look to kind of wear this whole top part out. Um, and so this one, I'm trying to play up a little bit different. The whitewash is a little bit fresher. It's less worn out. Uh, it's less abused um, and all those kinds of things. So, you know, there's, I have that variety in my portfolio of two very, very similar vehicles um, in the same basic scheme, but have two totally different, you know, just overall looks and tones and, and wear and tear. So that was kind of why that is a little bit what it is. That's kind of me putting on the model hat dude and saying, hey, So that's where we're at. that's where it is. Uh, the top part here. So this whole entire compartment's basically done it, and you can see in a couple spots. And we did this down on the on the on the hatches here, where I didn't really weather this hatch here too much. And over here, I haven't really weathered this these two hatches right up here. And what I'm doing is I'm using all the other weathering around them to kind of give them some in uh, kind of uh, born in you know kind of contrast, if you will, kind of letting them kind of be kind of quiet, and they actually tend to give their own visual appeal out of that nature so because this little hatch in particular is almost always flipped open um, and then this is the hatch here that the the, the, the um, actual gunner site so i think this is yeah that is the gunner here commander loader that makes sense um that hatch right here these two hatches are often open almost all the time because the the, the targeting sites come out of here um, and that's the closed down the closed hole configuration but usually these are all open again i bought this model built up as is so all these hatches were glued shut I didn't really have any options in terms of being the model builder and I bought it for the sake of testing on, which is we've taken the testing a little bit crazy, but you know, hey, we like to build models here on Rinaldi Studio Press Studios, don't we? Uh, and I did a little bit of work down here. Uh, I played with the rush tones, uh, the King Art stuff, just to see, you know, kind of what the colorways were looking like uh, and just kind of playing up the colors, the breakups, the grays, and, and just kind of building up. These are all, this is all oil paint work in here. Um, so the new stuff is, let's see, just so you guys can fresh, uh, is all this panel. These hatches here are all new. This was all weathered up. This has all been weathered up over here through the front. Um, this has all been weathered up through here. And then this section has been weathered up. I did a little bit more tie-in work um, up over in here, up in here. Uh, I had mentioned that in, a few, in earlier streams where I hadn't really touched that little kind of hidden area in there. So I kind of tied all that in, finished that off, um, punched this up a little bit more. And again, it would be fun. I, I do have to go back through. I don't know how to do it. I've, I've not really edited stuff to any heavy, heavy degree, but I'd probably, uh, don't be surprised if say in a couple of months you see like a Stug, you know, video edited of all the live stream comment kind of, we talked about this last, somebody mentioned it, of kind of connecting all the dots together to where you can see the full piece all the way through the live streams. So I'll probably do something like that in the future for some of these. This one, this one would, would warrant that conversation. I was playing with the white on the nose here last night a little bit to see kind of how it would do it. So a little bit of streaking, some other stuff. So let me show you what I was doing and we'll go through this a little bit. And then uh, I played with the Santa Fe rail engine um, and we'll get back onto that here in the second part of the demo. And then we'll get to the, we'll get to the Gundam weapons as well. Yeah, so we're already at four o'clock. So lots of talking, but lots of good stuff to talk about. Kind of bring up the, um, the King Art stuff, which is pretty cool, pretty cool. Cool for everybody. It's always good to have another resource anyway, especially tools, you know. But it is kind of that dude conversation all the time. I mean, you talk about one brand, it's always a comp comp competition to another. <laughs> like it's all of that, you know? We always like to do that. Well, you know, it's good and bad. I would say too, if the, and again, a lot of it is if, if you're kind of on the newer end of the conversation, those of you experience, you, you have your own stuff for a while, you know, and that's that's fine. But those of you on the newer end of the conversation, it's it's be open-minded, you know, listen listen to all the opinions, all the voices out there. There's a lot of dudes, uh, you know, especially in the YouTube world. Um, okay, so we've added this guy's new, and then this little uh, stippler dude here, stiffler, little stiffler. So these two we're gonna add in the, the repertoire. We still got these guys that are number twos there. So we have a couple colors and then a blender. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. So I'm gonna start on the fender and pull the light over here a little bit. Maybe adjust. Okay. Zoom in. Okay, is there any, depending on the age and the use of the tank, you could go to the bare metal, absolutely. 
And you, you'll even see that on new construction equipment too. It just depends on the hit. You know what I'm saying, Wayne? It depends on um, the, the type of impact. If you know, if it's a new tank put to the front lines and it went through an artillery brush, shrapnel cut it right down to the metal. Um, the Glaze Tiger II has that kind of damage on it. Or if it gets in a machine gun fight and it's getting peppered with 50 cal or 30 cal, it'll, it'll punch all the, the paint chips all the way down through. So it just depends. Okay, just making sure I get my shit straight here. Uh, the first initial stuff. So what I'm going to be doing here, let me zoom out just a little bit so we can see some initial blending stages going on here. Let's try this one. Okay. So the first couple brush strokes, we'll just show you some blending. So what I did with the King Art stuff, because it was in that in that beautiful box of 24 colors, I just put the 24 colors out as just to see what it was. So I would probably tune this a little bit later on. I don't need all of these colors out per se, because there's a lot of blue replication. There's a lot of orange and red replication that I just don't need right now. They have four or five greens. Uh, there's actually there is a purple shade in here there is a pure violet um, shade in there which is pretty cool um, a lot of these colors would be really cool moving in the gundam world too this is this is kind of be that conversation with you know doing the blues and stuff and the, and the reds and the purples and the yellows uh for weather and the gunpla to fade to paint and do all that kind of which i'm actually keen to get to i'm really excited because i think you know with the high new conversation the nightingale the color spectrums of the, the you have white purples blues and and, and heavy reds uh, fantastic, and then I was uh, guys were talking about uh, weathering white uh, Gunham schemes. Uh, so good stuff coming with that. Let's get some of this. Let me get some uh, some thinner down. Sorry, I'm taking a little bit of time here. Let's get going. Okay, so this is this is me popping the top. Those they actually don't. None of them feel dry, so they are holding with their brand new oil. So they they should. It's about 24 hours. So what I like to do when we start a session is just kind of give a little bit of a poke and then we'll put a little bit of fresh thinner down because that way you can blend them quicker and faster onto the brush. Because what's happening, these are a little bit on the dry side so you have to kind of juice them up a little bit. And that's normal with every kind of beginning parts of the session. After about 20, 30 minutes of playing with the session, um, what you find um, pretty quickly is, is these are, actually I think an eyedropper just did. Um, so I just put a little bit of fresh thinner down. And this is day two and day three of the OPR palettes get pretty juicy, which is where they get that real beautiful blended, you know, messy look, which is kind of nice. Kind of means you've done some work. Question, when you do your blending on the cardboard, do you ever have it wet enough that you don't have to unload on the paper? Yeah, you just depends, Corey. You know, the, the, the um, paper towel is your volume control. So if you don't need it for whatever reason, then you don't need it. But I, you know, almost always recommend it because if, because if I do this, if I'm in the thinner and then I'm in the, the paint right now, if I go right to the model, dude, you're just slapping down a lot of paint and thought of thinner, like you're out of control. So the problem with that is, is, and with OPR in particular is, is you want to kind of stay in control a little bit so that what this does is this takes it down from a 10 to like a seven. And that way I know if I touch this, switch that over. So say if I'm over in here, I just grabbed it, I wasn't even paying attention. So that's that's a lot of fluid going down already and it's already spreading out. So it's, it's gonna be a position where it just depends on the effect you're going for, but I recommend almost always just kind of always popping into the, to the paper towel. So that right there, just because I was just trying to show you, I don't know if you guys can see that, there it goes. Yeah, see how it's spread out so far already? That's, that's you don't want that. And that's that's why I use a paper towel. There's no real advantage to not doing it. I don't know why you wouldn't. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So that's why you know it, I'm trying to think of a, of a cor like a, a correlation to, to what that what that would be. But I like to think of it as like the volume knob. It's basically starting with the music. Like when you turn on the car and the volume's up to ten, it's like it's that conversation. So knock your volume down. Work a little bit slower. Work your way in. If you need to get it wetter and you don't need the paper towel, you're better off going into that slow. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's mix up. Oh, here, I wanted to show Chris Cortez. Uh, where you at? I don't know if you're still in stream or not. Okay. Just want to show mixing up the tan. So like I said before, they don't really provide a tan color in this particular packet, which is not the end of the world, but you do have your brown. Uh, it's right in here next to this bunch of blue that I have up in here. I don't know if you guys can see that a little bit. <clears throat> I'll have to go more on the palette here and just want to show you. 
So you have your two, you have two shades, a little bit interesting. This is a raw sienna right here. It looks like yellow ochre. Yellow ochre is actually right here. So these two colors are actually quite similar to me. I'm not, whoops, just stuck that in there like an idiot. But what I'm gonna do is basically pull some white and a little bit of brown. That's the raw, that's, uh, that's raw umber and burnt umber right there. That's what you're looking at. Kind of pull a little bit of white into this and get a little bit of brown. So that's actually kind of a nice, actually that's almost a, like a really pale warm gray. Kind of, a, it's a hint of tan. So I'm gonna pull a little bit of burnt umber. So raw umber's on the right, it's a little bit of, a, raw umber's a little bit of a darker blackish brown and then burnt umber's more of your pure kind of milk chocolate brown. Whereas raw umber's more of your dark chocolate brown. That probably makes sense to a lot of you. So that's a little bit of the, of the burnt going in. It warms it up a little bit more into the brown tone. So that's kind of a, a really nice dust color. I can come back over. That's how, that's how, so that right there. So if you're missing anything on any kind of color palette, whether you're buying three colors of oil and that's all you have, like if you can buy the three primaries and you have white, black, red, yellow, blue, like you're gonna have to learn how to blend uh, and mix tones to create your thing. Any buy color wheel, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's gonna be the easiest way to go. Um, but anyway, it, pure simple. If you need a blue, I have a little bit of white, I have a little bit of blue, and I mix up a baby blue. If you need a light tan, you have brown with the white. It makes up a really nice, easy tan color. Um, black, if you, if you need grays, um, always have a little bit of black because you can play with your black, your white, you have your grays, and then you can blend that into all the other color spectrums to desaturate those. So if you need, if your greens are really bright, pull in a little bit of gray into your greens, a little bit of yellow, and you can, you can bring them into the olive drab conversation. Um, those are just kind of basic preliminary. If you need a pink, you know, so why, that's why I said, when you guys ask me like what to buy, the first groupings, always have a white and a black, and then probably work a little bit on your earth tones, your, your dark greasy grimes, and then build on your primaries, uh, depending on your color spectrums. Like if you're a German armor guy and that's all you do, you're gonna want, you're gonna want a yellow, you're gonna want a yellow ochre, you're gonna want some reds and some greens, so you're gonna need a little bit more. If you're an OD guy, you're not gonna need probably some of these right away, I would say. You, you'd focus more on the olive draft conversation. Uh, so anyway, that's how that works. It's, it's important to refresh a little bit, but let's, let's get to work, because I'm itching to get on this guy. I know you guys are dying over there. You're like, paint the fucking model, Mike. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm on it. Okay, so light to dark. Try to keep this a simple conversation, so I remember, you remember. I'll put a little bit of dust down, just a, just a slight uh, yucky warm dust color there. Now even though it's it's a winter time, this just kind of gives it a little bit of depth to it because it's not going to really be a dusty model, but I'm just kind of getting this color tone on the model. And this is to give the color a little bit of life, a little bit of depth to it. And I will reiterate too, uh, I actually painted the white tones in kind of a creamy white, so it's th it leaves me some room for pure white, which is what you see over in the nose here, right there with that, right there. That's why you do that. When I talk about when you don't paint pure black or pure white as your actual base color, it's because you knock yourself into a corner. You don't give you any, any yourself any wiggle room. So by painting with an off-white to start with for your whitewash, and even if you take some white and drop in a little bit of, of like yellow or brown to it to kind of tone it down, um, that gives you room to add a pure white later on to build that back up and that gives you your contrast your visual contrast Which is kind of what I'm doing here with this a little bit of a dustier darker darker uh, Tones under these tools and that in the fender bracket there a little bit and that's a real simple way to do that It's kind of a sort of a shadow, but it's not really a shadow just yet per se because we're in that we're still in the light to dark conversation So we haven't even got to shadow colors so I'm just kind of continually mixing up this tan color and I'm shifting the tone over a little. And this is the, so my preference for blending, and one of the reasons I actually like this um, is the last little heat in the burn, uh oh. Uh, one of the things I really like about this, and I don't probably don't talk about this enough, uh, one of the pro tips, like the hints of, of what's going on here is when you're on a palette like this and you're mixing on the fly, you have the opportunity to tune that color left, right, or center all the time, every single time. And the beauty of that and if you correlate it to the pigment conversation is now instead of just putting down like one dust color, like one oil paint color as a dust color, I've got four or five tones I'm building up now because I'm pulling in a little bit of brown, a little bit of white. Sometimes I'm pulling a little yellow ochre. So I've got like, I'm playing with some stuff here. I'm playing a little bit of grays, a little bit of blues. So my dust tone is shifting all the time. And I'm doing this a little bit instinctively, but it is something for you guys that, as you advance through this to start thinking about. One of the powers of the palette is like the, like the volume control, you can control the color spectrums too. 
So this gives you a little bit more visual interest over time. And like I was talking about with the book demo, that, or you know, pull up the pages to show you the Stug versus Stug, I like the fact that my models don't have the same flavor between each one of them. If they're this, like it's just winter Stug, they're two totally different models, and I like that about it, so. So for me, anyway, I mean, that's not to say you have to do that, but just that's part of the nice part about it. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm dying over here. All right, Paul, have a very nice night, buddy. Uh, you're very welcome. All righty, so that's kind of what's going on with that. And in this particular model too, what I've started to do is play with a little bit more of the cooler tones to kind of pull through some of the Panzer Gray values um, back through the whitewash a little bit. So I'm moving from kind of a dust to a light gray as well. <coughs> Excuse me, got a little tickle there. And again, we're, we're, it's more exposed, I can go a little bit darker. And this is just getting the early stages down. So there's a little bit of kind of a, a light gray, a light tan, a hint of blue, and at times a little bit of hint of green. It's kind of what I'm playing with. And then I've got a little bit of black and white on the ends of that to kind of control that spectrum of how intense. <clears throat> and that's what I find the black and white does is it kind of controls the intensity of your colorway. Like if you're trying to get a shadow color and you just need to punch it and punch it and punch it up, you can use more and more black in that a little bit um, to kind of get that going. This is really wet. I gotta dry this off. <clears throat> Too much thinner down. That diamond flake texture just kind of spreads it all out. So that's okay. And have that hair dryer handy, guys. So now I'm just kind of building up a little bit more colorways in that same region. It's a little bit drier now. That was good. It was a little too wet. Kind of have to get, this is one of the things with demo work is you do have to kind of get a little bit in the zone. I do have to transition from being a chatty mofo to uh, being, being artistic. Let's get uh, keep going with this stuff. Also the camera's in the way. I can't, see, I can't get in and see my palette. But I am excited though, because that, that I did read the specs on the on the iPhone 13, so I will talk about that because it's a nice let me background. Is the music even on? By the way, can you guys hear the music? I have to go to work. Have a good day, buddy. Go to Kai, Mr. Ma Mr. Master Mark. What do you got to say? I've been talking a lot, my friend. <laughs> I will say that much, Brian. I've been talking a lot today. Mm. That's funny. Bump on my own. Okay. Yeah, so Apple announced their new phones. God damn it. Keep doing that. Hold on. And the only thing I care about at this point in time with, with the cell phone conversation is the cameras, because everything else kind of works all the same across the board. And this is, like I said, this is the iPhone 12 that we're using right here. And because of the budget constraints of RSP and the printing and all that stuff, I'm not gonna be buying a, a new camera or enhancing the setup with an actual real camera anytime soon, at least not through 2021. So because we pay monthly service fees and monthly leases, you know, it's not too hard to switch over from one phone lease to another phone lease. Uh, the thing I liked about the 13 uh, news yesterday was a 13 Pro all the cameras are updated, or are quite heavily updated in terms of their, their quality spectrum, apparently. Um, but the 13 Pro version, not the regular one, so there's the 13, the 13 Pro, and then I think the Pro Maxes and stuff, but the Pro is where it starts with, they've introduced the six times optical zoom versus the digital zoom. And that's what you're seeing. When I do this, this is a, digi this is a two times optical zoom, and it's limited, that's it. The one coming has a six times, which means I can keep this setup, which is really nice, and then we'll have basically that much better, better zoom ability uh, to really get a little bit. And I think that's going to be a nice upgrade for what I'm trying to do with this. Because again, I don't have the money to buy an actual camera to do this with, but I like the fact that I can interact with the cell phone quite easily now that I'm comfortable with it being in my face the whole time. Like I'm used to it, even though I bump it, I bump it less than I used to, right? I think I bump it with my cheek more than anything. 
Anyway, I think I've got that fender pretty good. Kind of a general weathered fender. Um, and let's get a little bit. So that's going to be something I'm thinking of probably coming in a month or so. I think we can start ordering them. A couple This weekend we can order them or something, if I'm correct in that. But I did. I do look at the camera specs because the, the chips and the speed and the in the screen OLED, OLED, all that stuff that doesn't mean nothing to me. I don't play video games on my phone anymore because I'm old. And those of you over 40 years old trying to play video games on your phones, you will know what I'm talking about. You're buying iPads and all that stuff already. So I'm just punching up around this little bracket here. So that was pretty cool. So I'm always repositioning the model depending on the angle of, of where I'm trying to reach, where I'm going to try to get in this little side thing here. So this is the tricky part of the stood. It's getting this little kind of junction past the, uh, the fender there. Plus, I gotta turn it. I gotta turn it this way to reach that. Okay. This is why I like that really precise. Go slow. Take your time. It's no rush. So what I mean by that is, for example, I think I pay thirty bucks a month for the iPhone 12. I have my regular phone plan, but your lease fee is, your, I think, it's thirty bucks. Well, the new one's forty. Well, Michael, I can afford ten dollars more, so I think we'll do it. That's what I was talking about. Because I think that'll that'll be a nice stream enhancement, to be honest with you. I do like the mini size. I like it in the pocket size better, um, and the and the regular phone size is actually twice the weight. I did read that. The, um, the 13 mini and the 12 mini are under five ounces, and I don't know what gram weight that is, but. Alexa, how many grams is five ounces? Five ounces is about Oh, dude, you be a little specific, girl. Uh, 140, 140 grams. So like a, like a, like a, a medium-sized metal watch. So, but the the the, um, the regular iPhones double the weight, it's almost eight ounces, seven point something. Phil is late. Oh, dude, what am I gonna do with you guys? Corey, what's wrong? Simple as Oh, I don't care about that. Yeah, no, I, my only concern, Corey, is just the camera. And I'm gonna everything's Apple for me, so I'm not I'm not you know I have nothing to do with brand again. <laughs> Why are we Ronaldo rich? Yeah, bro. <laughs> if you saw the bank account, um, but we all pay seventy bucks a month in the U.S. for a phone, don't we? Am I wrong in that? I mean, if you're on the family plan and it's a hundred bucks for four lines, that's different, but I'm single. So every single person in America who has no family like me, you don't get a family plan. They just screw you. So you pay 65 for the line and you have a lease fee for the phone. And it's going to be 10 bucks for a cheapie or 20 bucks or 30 bucks for an iPhone. That's, you know, that's how that plays out. Yeah. But the, the Apple made the iPhone five in, in the square edge case. That was, it's a good size. I like, I don't need a big screen. I, I don't watch anything on my phone. It's like I have a tablet for all that stuff. So I've always preferred that. And then I bought the, the big ones one time just to say, Hey, what's up with the big phone? Dude, that was a nut. <laughs> like, Cause I always have it in my front pocket. I was like, no, like, no, dude, you need to get out of there. It's just too much. So that's why when, when they brought the mini, uh, case shape back, I really liked that. But yeah, they're not. I think all the phone prices are all unless you're buying just like a phone on the go thing. I mean, for as much as we use our phones, it's you know, you're all paying 50 to 100 bucks a line or whatever you're doing. I mean, I'm guessing that's kind of what's going on. Right. I, and I hate the fact that single people get screwed. Like, I, why don't I if, if you sell four lines for 100 bucks, it's 25 bucks a line. Why can't I buy it for 25 bucks a line? <laughs> you guys are like, shut up, dude. Sorry. But it's true. That's I, I just I just the stuff drives me insane. I mean, just the level of greed and all that stuff that goes with those. That I will talk shit about. <laughs> Same thing with the TV stuff with the sus subscriptions. Like with Sling. So if if you guys are familiar with the Sling TV apps, um, as you watch me just kind of weather some shit up, I'll I'll just kind of chat today. If you have any questions about what I'm doing, just give a shout. But yeah, so Sling TV has orange and blue channels and they take like 25 in one group and whatever the orange 
channel selection is of, of those 25 channels and then they put the other group in the blue channels and then if if you like this type of viewing arts and crafts or history you get the orange package if you like kind of more news and sports and, and entertainment you get the blue package so they put college football in the fucking orange package with espn and then they put all the pro stuff in the blue package so you have to buy both if you like both and then if you want to watch red zone which is the coolest way to watch football you have to buy the sports extra package so what's twenty dollars is now sixty five dollars just so you can watch and they do that on purpose and that's what i'm talking about that's screwing the people over that's gimmicky uh, that's that's i'm just like no 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 that's not how that goes but what am i going to do you know and i'm texting my brother this who's just laughing at me because he goes that's michael problems and he goes i've got the fubu for like 75 bucks a month i get all the channels i could do i'm at 65 i'm still 10 bucks cheaper than you so shut up <laughs> little brothers man They're always doing that stuff to you which is why the peyton eli show guys if you haven't seen the peyton eli monday night football show it is put that on your your calendar to watch this stuff okay let's add a little bit more white back to this so what i was doing was just trying to weather up that little uh that area right in there under that uh, engine crank handle it's always a little bit of a tricky spot on this without going crazy So when you see me switch a brush, what I'm doing is I'm trying to pick up the red, the red stripes or the blenders, and then the gold stripes are the colors. I'm just real casually, real, real chill, just building up a little bit of just dirtier tones on top of the fenders. It's gonna collect anyway. And I'm using both, I, I blend out that way and I blend direction of the vehicle as well. So it just kind of gives a little bit of, Corey, what are you doing? I have so a nice perk to counteract the sling bitching and moaning about sling. So I, I use sling from September through January, and then I turn it off. Uh, Hulu is free with uh, I'm a Sprint T-Mobile guy, so I think they still have it. I think it's still part of the deal where you get free Hulu. So I get the free base Hulu, but if you want no ad Hulu, you have to pay the full seventeen dollars a month. And you can't you can't pay the difference between the free Hulu, which I think is nine bucks a month, which is the ad Hulu, and then the, the no commercial Hulu, the, you know the, the tiered element. So you have to start from scratch if you. So I just have the free Hulu with commercials, and, and Netflix is off right now. So I have Sling on, Netflix off. Uh, I cleared HBO last month um, just to see what was going on at HBO. So HBO is off, and I do like you can turn them on and off in the phone with your subscri sub subscriptions. That's a nice uh, way to go. I do like that. So I do get Hulu for free, so I don't complain about that. But I don't actually watch a lot of Hulu. I was watching The Handmaid's Tale. If you guys haven't seen that one, that's that's a hoot. That's a real happy show. <laughs> oh man, I love it. The best thing about The Handmaid's Tale are the grocery stores. I go, my OCD kicks in. They have these, um, am I missing questions by the way? You just yell at me if I am. Um, yeah, so I have Apple TV, you have Roku, my brother has FUBU, yeah, it's all those things. And I, I learned how to learn all about that stuff. Uh, what was I gonna do? Uh, oh, I'm gonna put some snow. I meant to put some white back down. So real quick, I'll get back. I'll get back on point, my friends. Hopefully, this just kind of shows you how low key o OPR weathering and stuff like this kind of actually is. So when you've got kind of a nice middle range tones of stuff, you come back in. It's not white enough. So let's get back a little bit more pure white. Sometimes I like to play up the trapped whitewash that gets kind of doesn't really come back out because it's in in those spots that are a little bit tough to get to. Oops, I got a little bit on that crank handle. See how I just kind of soften that up real quick? So I streak it out, I get a little bit of direction to it. And then what I do is, I've talked about before where I blend around, so I've got this general shape, right? So I don't really blend in the center there. I blend around the edges here, just kind of soften that. And this is, this is how precise and gentle and easy this is, just like that. So anytime you do something like that, where you get, okay, so here's a good comp, uh, 
comparison of what I'm talking about. Over here is just the airbrush work and a little bit of the chipping work. And so you've got the pure white that's kind of, res or the, the, the original off-white that I painted with. It actually looks fairly bright. And you've got kind of the dirtiness over here, kind of this dirt grime kind of thing. And then by coming, popping that white back in a little bit, you can see how I rebuild the layer up a little bit. It's kind of a white, and I do this with white more than anything. Like if it's the light to dark conversation, but you can pop the white back over it. Uh, it's kind of a nice, fun way to play. Uh, was I selling phones, Brian? Would you ask, Brian? Would you ask? Let me go back up. J Day, how are you? The only thing people who watch live, seen commercials, not skipping it. Dude, I'm telling you what, that is so true. I, you know, I, I watch the Olympics and a couple other stuff, but football is my stuff. So I, you know, Tour de France, whatever is fine. Um, I don't watch a ton of baseball. Basketball season was kind of super weird, so I didn't really watch a lot of it. But now I'm on regular TV. Get, dude, commercials are up the wads. I'm, oh, oh my god, talk about bitching and moaning. Talk about first world problems. Um, in terms of phone, yeah, I'd imagine. And, and uh, question, okay, sorry, Brian. Let me get your, let me get serious, dude. On how do you feel about the lazy Susan turn, turn, turn. Uh, So the only problem I have is keeping it on camera. This is actually how, uh, Brian, how I usually work. So this is the the Target brand. Uh, you get this in the kitchen section. Um, this, it's their soup. These are probably three or four. They're stackable. So I've got a closet full of like five of these. And before I got into camera work, one of the things that was nice about the stackable things was that, for example, um, certain pieces, when you, like I position this a certain way, I can increase the height of that to get kind of that exact precise thing. If I'm working on a model over weeks and weeks of time, like that's a really kind of useful process. And I know there's the octopus and some other newer devices that have come out to kind of give us this thing, but this is kind of the, the modular option and the price point again. And then if you want to clean these, throw them in the dishwasher, dude, they're dishwasher safe. Genius. Cause I'll get pigments and oils and paints on them. And then I'll take the, the melamine pads, you know, the Mr. Clean magic erasers, get all the paint off and I'll freshen them up, you know, once a month or so. So they're nice and pretty for you guys, but I love them. This is how I work. So what, you, and I'm trying to show that to you, Brian, it's a good question. Cause I'm trying to show my process and workflow. Uh, as much as I can so these it's you know to truly cut through so you guys can see but you can see how nice this is right where, where I set this up where I can get this angle I can spin this real quick I can get this angle here I'm always looking I'm always evaluating even when I'm selling phones <laughs> so th there's that I mean, is the music, music might be a little too loud <laughs> but anyway that's hopefully that answered that question I like them Brian. I do I've been working this way for a decade so that, you know, like a typical dude, it'd be hard for me to change to something else. Even though I've seen the octopus, but I think it's, you know, a hundred bucks or whatever it is, or 80 bucks, 75 bucks. So you're gonna have to spend a little money. Put a little money in the honey for this. Okay, so I have not weathered this panel yet. And I've, I've weathered this guy a little bit. I've weathered a little bit over here. The tools have some general weathering on right now. I haven't weathered under them. And I haven't really weathered the end, inside of that intake grill that's behind that uh, gun, gun cleaning rod. So this is the, these two pieces here joined together and then the soldiers stand on the front of the tank and they, they clean that out like a giant rifle barrel. That's what this is. This is a soft uh, textile fabric thing that's designed to clean the rifling out of the, the, that's the gun cleaning rods. You have your shovel, you have your ax, your fire extinguisher with the really nasty mold line that I never took off. So. Uh, this apparent fire extinguisher was a two-part, special German design two-part with a, a big part line down the middle. So we're just going to ignore that because <laughs> that would be like, if I put that on missing links, the first thing Roy Chow would say, and if he ever shows up and hears, because he did this to me one time, because dude, you got a nice mold line on your tools. <laughs> like, damn it. Chris Babs, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. So anyway, just sig please ignore that. <laughs> I didn't even notice that one time. And that's because, you know why you never notice it? Because I'm so busy doing all this stuff. The model is almost always like this. You don't see it. And then one, I think the other day when I did this, because I haven't worked on this side almost at all, I went, oh, shit. No, I'd fix it if I was going to be, like, serious about it. But this is, you know, we're just fucking around. We're just having a good time. We're just, like, on a date, you know. We're just talking sports on a date. That's all we're doing, guys. Turn that a little white. That sounds a little too wet. A little bit more paint while that thinner is still going. Switch that to the blender real quick. Kind of stipple this out a little bit. Can push some a little bit vertical, go a little bit higher here. I'm gonna just push that around and see how I got kind of a a soft blending of a, of a white on white kind of a distempered look kind of streak that back down a little bit 
We'll hit that with the hair dryer. And now the sun comes out. So it's a really subtle white on white. That's the beauty of working with the whitewash. You can do some really, really fun effects with the, the tone on tones and all that kind of stuff. What's your opinion on the Lazy Susan Bryan? Cough, cough, Patreon. Yeah, we're, I got to get on that too. I promise. Actually, most of my off uh, camera stuff has been with the printer the last two weeks. So I've, I've, I've made a note because I know a few of you have, have reminded me politely to get on that and I've not and, and I keep pushing it off. So um, I did uh, talk to YouTube, which is which is kind of nice. I was a little bit nervous about that. Uh, one of the things that had happened, I think like two streams ago, somewhere, I don't know what I did or how it happened. Uh, the live chat replay isn't up there. Like when you go back to watch the video, you don't, you can't see the live chat, uh, which is a little bit frustrating because I think it lowers the value of the videos because you just look at me talking to the screen. <laughs> kind of stupid. But anywho, uh, I reached out to YouTube and, and they do have a, uh, actually, because I'm in the partner program, they have a pretty decent little... Uh, customer service base. I uh, did a nice chat with the dude and he kind of helped me out and cleared some stuff up. So they made some adjustments on their end in terms of the live, like when you set these up for the streaming that you got to make sure you have both live chat clicked and live chat replay clicked. And I had to reset that. So I did that for this stream. So we should be good to go. Um, but I also tried to, um, the super chat and super sticker should be working, but I'm not sure why they're on. And I think they have to approve it, even though I've already been pre-approved for it. So I, I, I did put that back through. So in lieu of Patreon for now, uh, yeah, right. um, yeah, there's gonna be no Tinder advice. <laughs> so it was a miserable experience. Um, although I do think Tinder still says I'm 36. <laughs> Just keeping that one going as long as I can. I told you guys that story, right? Years ago. I don't. I'm not on Tinder now. I haven't been on Tinder a long time. But um, so we're trying to get the super chats. The the they have a subscription level service through YouTube as well. Um, so we'll get some of that set up here in the future. My big, so to talk about Patreon real quick, my big concern as, as making this kind of content now is, is with Patreon in particular, there's a point where they deserve and are paying for exclusive content. And I'm, that's where I'm buffering up against like, I'm all my time's filled. So how do I make extra exclusives for that purpose? That's where I'm kind of like, okay, I got to figure this out. Um, so I've been a little bit hesitant with Patreon in terms of that, but I might just turn it on just to, to have like a low tier kind of just support the channel process That's kind of a thing, which I think is what you guys would really like to have anyway. All right. I got to bounce for dinner. Talk to you soon. You got it. Kodokai. We'll talk later. <laughs> Roy Chow is super knowledgeable. I haven't talked to Roy in a long time. Hope he's doing well. Okay, so what I've been doing while I've been talking is just kind of slowly building up. So what was brought up a while back, um, uh, Leo Tattoo, uh, customer and all that kind of stuff, he had mentioned because he does tattooing and does actual 2D artwork in, in his painting. Uh, as he's learning this, he very astutely mentioned to me or said, hey, what I'm seeing is what it really looks like. And I do talk about it sometimes. And I will reemphasize it here for what you can see right here is basically the glazing technique of what is kind of like we call a filter in the art world, it's glaze. What I work with oftentimes, or most of the time I would say in terms of this kind of weathering here is a really thin translucent layer that's layered, layered and layered and layered. Um, so what I'm doing here is, is you can see that that's actually just a hint of, of, of hyper thin gray color. And I've just slapped that down just to show you. And then what I do is I blend it real quick and in this particular case of just in what you see right there, see how it just kind of just punched up the depth of the Panzer gray peeking through the white. So that's what I was, and that's what you see up over here. When, when, oh, lost them. So what, what you see in a lot of this, oh, I got a little bit of thinner up top here. Got a little overbleed there. Getting a little bit of a tide mark. You can see that there. I wiped, that's where I wiped it back. So let me... Looks like I got a little bit... I don't know if I'm not... Oh, it's the... Is it the one? I'm seeing a little bit of something there. It might be from last night. I've actually got good light now. The sun finally came out. I've been working in the cloudy skies for a minute here for the last two days. Um, but what I do is I build these up. Like here, we'll do this again. I'll show you. So what I'm doing is I'm getting a little bit of like a pale gray 
hint of blue, hint of brown in it. So on the paper towel right there, and then that's almost no color. Maybe a little bit more going here. And this is where the, the palette on the cardboard, I'm blending up a lot of the oils that are in the middle there. Okay, so there's, there's a little bit of color here. So it's a little bit of tone on tone. I put it, see there's kind of a dark patch right here. So that's kind of the Panzer Gray peeking through the whitewash. And I put some of that other white down. And so what I do is I come back in here, lay that down really thin. And then I take my blending brush, because it's mostly thinner anyway, you don't add any more thinner. You just come in and you just kind of, you just kind of slightly just kind of can repaint it where you want it. So that adds a little, like it's another translucent layer on top of the previous layer. And that's, I do this quite often and I probably don't talk about it enough in terms of the actual physical process. Uh, hey, it gives me good commentary in the 35th Armor Group. Uh, no, Roy is actually very, uh, very, very knowledgeable. He's one of the smarter dudes. He uh, hung out in the Allied discussion group on missing links for me. Oh, I go back with Roy 20 years, so, uh, so I was joking with that. He mentioned that one time years ago and I, with, the, with the, the seam on a tool handle. Uh, I always joke about it with him. Uh, casting marks, absolutely. Um, yeah, Marino, this is this is super, super low stress. As you can see, I'm obviously in a pretty chill mode. Uh, things are going well. Printing is going well again. Um, shipping conversations at least calm down to where we can figure it out, figure out some solutions. Um, question off topic. One of Martin's older videos, uh, I think it was the Yag Tiger, he mentioned that you can't brush paint mission paints over mission. Found that weird. Uh, there is a little bit of it. So what happens is, you, is you're rewetting the paint um, and it's a water soluble paint. And so there is a curing window. And if you push it too fast, if you go brush on brush, with mission models, because if there's a curing window and it's water soluble, it is a rewettable paint, it does reactivate the lower layers. Yes, you can brush paint with it, but you have to make sure your base layers are fully dried out. Uh, I had to do, if, if you go back, we actually did all the brush painting with the tool handles. I was pushing it pretty fast. Um, and, and there was a few moments where I had to kind of go back over it a little bit. And that's because I, was, I wasn't letting that lower layer dry quite enough. Uh, and then once you get past that phase, then you can brush paint over it quite easily, just like every other water-based acrylic. But there is a, a re-wettability to it, uh, and there is a curing window to it. So they kind of uh, interplay with each other, and that's what he was bumping up against. And that's because, and frankly, it, it's nothing to do really with the brand conversation. It's just in that particular moment, he wasn't aware of that. And so once you learn about the certain way certain brands play and act, then you just have to man maneuver yourself to adjust to, to achieve the right results. Um, and it's a little bit like the, the um, question about chipping with the brush paint and stuff. You have to maneuver it to get it to where it'll work. It will work. It's not going to look the same as airbrush chip paint, but you can do certain things. But the brush painting with Mission Models is because of, of what, he was, what that was. And that's all that's about. <clears throat> uh, eBay has hardware built in. Your Lazy Susan, great for airbrushing for men on a rail card. Yeah, these lazy, I find the Lazy Susan is fantastic. I, don't, I know Brian had a bail. I don't know if he caught my answer or not. Bill Kling Bill, hello. Handmaid's Tale is awesome. Yes. It finally ended on a somewhat strong note. I don't know if there's more seasons coming, but uh, yeah. So yeah, so T-Mobile gives you Netflix for free. Sprint gives you Hulu for free. Uh, back to that. <laughs> I'm just scrolling up to make sure I didn't miss any more questions because I was chatting for a while. Corey is a Samsung dude. iPhone 13, Rinaldi. <laughs> it's kind of so funny, Marino, but it's 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 what it is. Is um. I'm gonna say what that was. Um, I was talking about, so I have a photographer for a friend in Los Angeles. She's a wedding photographer. And so she's obviously super knowledgeable at cameras. Um, and she was kind of the one of the persons I was talking in the beginning, like, how do I really do this? How do I figure this out? Because my concern really is that you guys really see the brushwork, like really, really see the brushwork. Actually, I should have to close that. That sun is popping hard. Um, and so, but because of the way this iPhone situation has turned into where it's a pretty decent hand camera and I don't have any help in terms of having an assistant to, to physically film me, um, this is this has given this me the ability because it's, it's actually worked out fairly well. It's a little clumsy at times and I've bitched about it and the autofocus sucks. I'm getting a harsh, oh, the sun is like right there. Sorry about that. Oh, even though it makes the white pop. <laughs> Look at that, that looks awesome. Um, so yeah. That's why that is. So I think that what I was reading about the 13 um, technical specs on the phone, 
Uh, I think the camera improvements actually hammer everything. I've, other than, I don't know about the autofocus, but the other stuff could be really cool. E28s, what are they like to live with? Uh, interested in maybe perhaps getting one. Uh, anything German made between 1984 and 1994 are superb cars. Porsche, BMW, Volkswagen, Audi, all excellent, excellent vehicles. And that is because the Bosch components that most of them use uh, they really got their shit together. They all work pretty well. Most of them are dead real. If I have a failure, like for example, uh, my master cylinder went out. And if you research master cylinders in an 80s German car, they go out once every 20 years. Mine finally gave, it's 275,000 miles on the car. Finally give up, that's fine. That's not an E28 problem. If, does that make sense? It's kind of like the mission models thing. Like you just have to learn about what it is. Like in and of itself, the car is fine. The, the straight sixes, I probably get half a million miles out of the motor. Now the problem you're gonna have, Marino, and I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna be real honest, with you, you're gonna pay up the butt for one. I paid, I underpaid at 3,500 10 years ago for mine. Or not 10 years, about eight years ago. But uh, of all that stuff, 911s, E28s, 2002s, GT, old GTIs, uh, first and second generation Volkswagen GTIs. Um, just kind of making sure I got my shit straight here. Oh yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna pay a pretty penny. I'd put 10K aside if you want to get one, 15K for a good one, 20K for pristine, and anything in M5, you're going to pay 30, 40, 50,000 for uh, in the E28 conversation. 944 turbo. So the 44 turbo is a little bit more complicated because a little bit, uh, they're 928s and 944s. If they're maintenance, uh, if they have not been taken care of, you're going to have expensive bills. If they're really well taken care of, you shouldn't have really any too many problems. And that's what most, if you're buying a 30 year old car, if they were poorly taken care of and it was like some some kid wanted to, to, to F it up and make it all super fast, you're gonna pay to repair all his his immaturity. <laughs> Does that make sense? That's how that usually works. And that's that holds for JDM, for Euro. You know, you get past the 15, 20 year mark now because we're at 2021, 2022. Uh, cars really change from 2000 plus. So anything pre 2000, you know, they're they're pretty straightforward doesn't really matter the brand that because from like say early 80s to 2000 they kind of figured it all out and then they started adding computers and all that stuff so um, yeah prices for all that stuff is gonna go nuts okay okay so I'm just my palettes drying a little bit here so let me mix up some fresher tones here we'll keep going let's we'll, we'll go a little bit uh, you know, let me shift over here. Let's do a little bit. Of, let's put some earth tones down where the, the broken fender is now because we can kind of start building up. We can start moving. So we're coming in kind of, I'm going to kind of do a, a, a pincer movement where this fender into this fender to work this front section. So on the previous model from, from Tank Art 4, I put a, put a heavier pigment look up in here. So I'm just going to go a little bit more of a, a calm down earth tone oil through here a little bit. I've kind of done some previous work before in this in this specific section right here. Like this little section of what I've done a little bit of weathering coming in from the from the first uh, we started here. We've worked our way around. We're kind of looping. We're kind of com finally coming to the end of some of this stuff. So I'm just punching up kind of the warm of, of kind of an earth tone without getting super dusty. And I'm intentionally doing this look to maintain certain balance of the colors. Like in, the model weighs nothing; it's just a plastic model. So I'm just <laughs> just moving around with the with the drive sprockets. Uh, I lost my headlight. My headlight covers right here, down here. It, I broke it, but it goes right here. That's why the red primer is popping. I'll put that back. I'll do the lights, and I'll, I always do lights and everything like the last last bit. Um, so I've done a little bit of work up in here. Got a little Ikea furniture leg is my, my wood base here. Okay, there we go. Okay, push it over here. So you can see the lower, you can see as the angle gets down, kind of what I'm looking at here in terms of, I'm looking at my colorways over the roof. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep the contrast kind of in this, in this happy medium. Someone offered me 25K for the turbo two years ago. Yeah, if it's, if it's a good spot, I mean, 300E is another great one. One I'd actually looked at 190s for a while, but my only real problem with Mercedes is they don't offer a lot of manuals. Uh, I'm a manual transmission kind of only guy, so you'd have to buy the Cosworth, and, and, the, and I don't think the 300 ever came with a manual. 
Uh, so I'd use it, you know, I'd use it as a second car, which is fine. But um, the reason I picked up my E28 was it was a full manual, uh, which is pretty rare, and it had the sunroof and the full inside was is it was fully loaded up. It was the it was um, the wife's car, of a dentist or something. Super. It had two hundred thousand miles on it, but it was really really well taken care of. Just adding a little bit of just kind of a little bit of a shadow under that under that whole joint right there. So the hard thing with winter whitewash, I haven't really been talking about this too much. It's really easy to start blowing contrast out in terms of overdoing it between dirty and, and white. And as we've talked about before with the frozen tundra, the realities are very different up close and in person, you know. Bastonia is very different to Barbarossa. So you really have to be kind of conscious of fine tuning to the regions of what, of what you're doing and, and how you're kind of doing this. So what I'm really trying to do is the frozen tundra. It's been in use for a little while, but I don't really want to go too much earthy tones to, you know, I'm kind of adding a patina, excuse me, a patina to the white, but I'm trying not to really go too much. Like I have to back myself up up here and it was starting to get too much with this kind of almost like a chipped look up here and I keep kind of playing with it a little bit I put these like glazes on top of it to kind of tone that contrast down a little bit it shows up a little bit different on camera but it's about the fifth kind of really really thin layer of, of gray I've put up there I just keep doing that a little bit just to kind of, I keep looking at it going, I just kind of think that's too much sometimes. Although when you back off, like you're also zooming, when you, when you back off, like it looks, it looks fine. Like that's, that's a pretty nice little look right in there. But I just try to, I'm trying to calm down that contrast just a little bit. And I do, I like this panel so much, I don't want to mess with it too much. And that's kind of that disciplinary action. You have to be really careful with that because this is this is a, actually a fairly challenging. But you can see I've, I've bumped up the warmth through here. Just from a distance, you can see how that's already started to happen a little bit. And if you just, just gently build up around that hatch, that hatch starts to pop off in terms of visual contrast. So that's how I work those, my mental capacity when I'm doing that. And see how this tone here, this, this panel here is pretty neat. You don't really see it through certain angles, but as you rotate that, you get kind of that cool pop where it's a little bit more blue. Um, I'm just gonna leave it. I probably wouldn't, you know, you'd wanna have a little bit more of it elsewhere, but I'm just gonna kind of leave it as, as kind of a visual interest, kind of slightly different tint to it. It's me more having fun, a little bit. Uh, you're welcome, Matt. Another Matt's gotta go. Check the rest of the episode out on the flip side. You got it. Off top, yeah, OE20, we talked about that. So it's like oil paints. Question, can you hair dry the Mission Model painters? And uh, yeah, you know, totally, hair dry everything, dude. <laughs> All of it, every brand. Hair dry away. Uh, Stug down call the Berg Panther. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do want to do a Panzer III, Berg, uh, Berger, Berger Panzer III. Uh, it's one of the, this one model I haven't done, I've always wanted to do. Um, and then I was happy when they finally introduced the, I think it's, is it Ming and all the Burger Panthers came out, but it was always the Italeri kit. And then who had the resin kit that was really nice? Um, Tank Workshop, is that right or wrong? Somebody had a super nice resin one that was hyper, hyper detailed. And in fact, I think a lot of the plastic manufacturers started to research his to build up their plastic kits from, which is not uncommon because he did all the hard work. <laughs> Chinese are not about to say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at what he's doing. But I believe uh, all the new Burger Panthers are pretty nice kids. So. But I remember the day when we didn't have anything but Italy. And you had to use, uh, I think it was either a Verlinden resin set uh, until that, until that uh, tank workshop one showed up. But I've not done any recovery vehicles, so it is on my to-do list. But I would start with, whoops, I would start with the three the Burger Panzer, Panzer III. Uh, that would be my thing with the with the Oskatten. I think it's a cool look. Uh, T, uh, TMD, thank you. Tiger model design. 
I always get Tiger Model Design and Tank Workshop in my brain. Um, I forget the guy's name. I used to talk to him quite, Joe Bakanovitz or something like that. It's been a, been a minute since I've talked to him. There was a moment when I was working with uh, Ampersand Publishing that we were gonna we were gonna do a full blown project. I think I'd finished the Lee because the Academy Lee has um, it might be TMD it might be TMD who did the Lee resin for that, and then the formation stuff and Tasca early pieces of the Tasca kit that Academy Lee I did had was just a uh, literal smorgasbord, uh, and I think we were talking to him about doing a Burger Panther project, Joe. I'm sure he's still around. Is Joe still around? Joe at Tiger Model. Is Joe still around? So I know we've lost a few. Uh, who else? We lost. Who did we lose? <sighs> it was not CMD. Is it CMD? Who was the other one, guys? Um, he, he just retired. He wouldn't lose him or anything. I think he just retired. He did a lot of German resin stuff in the U.S. I sold most of that stuff, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't really have... A, I kind of backed away from armor resin for... As the plastic kits really started to improve, you know, that kind of, you know, we saw what was coming with Mang and Tacom and, and Ryfield and, you know, I think Ryfield sent me, um, again, that goes back to that free conversation, but I said, sure. Um, what is the Tiger? It's the F-13 Tiger. It's the Tiger early late combo mishmash. Mishmash. Happy dog a boom. This old tank, he rolling home. There you go. Let's listen to me making music up as we go. So I'm pulling a little bit of blue, a little bit of brown, a little bit of yellow ochre, a little bit of light green, a little bit of black on my palette here. Let me zoom out just so you can kind of see this. It's a little bit interesting. So what I'm doing here, I will try to be serious for half a second today. So you can see it on the palette. You can see this is my working spectrum of colors here. So what I'm doing right in here in these front hatch areas, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start working my way around the hatches themselves. I'm going to start like what I was talking about a few minutes ago where I'm putting in that really like a glaze of the, the blue or gray color to pull up the Panzer gray. That's what I'm going to be doing right now. And I'm going to kind of work it around here. And then that's going to give me kind of a, a toned down white that's underneath it now. And then I'm going to come back with white and kind of repop some of the whitewash like what I what I showed you guys earlier around the the engine crank end. So let's let's get on with that program and see how that goes. So over here on the palette, we have black, gray, raw umber, burnt umber, my white, and I've got I think this is the cobalt blue. I forget which blue this is. There's like four three blues here, but this kind of French blue in the middle. So this cools off my my palette. And by cool is warm and cools. Reds are warm, blues are cools, that conversation. So I'm cooling off the grays and the browns over here. So I do this by pulling in the blue over into here, which is where you're getting kind of, this is, see how the cool, the bluey let looks? That's cool. It's cool, man, cool. So I got a little yellow ochre, a little black, a little blue. And then this color here is kind of a beat up light gray. That's, and see how that lightens that back up? Let's see, I probably zoom in a little bit on that. This will help you guys kind of just show you more of the brush blending. So here, this, again, this is the gray, black, the blues over here. So pulling a little bit of the blue from that, put that over here. There's a little bit of, so this is kind of this grayish blue. And so what I'm doing is I'm visually blending and I've got the model just to the left of me and I can see kind of where I'm at with it. Like, okay, this is a, a slightly yellowy gray blue. So let's take a little bit more of the brown and kind of warm that up a little bit because the browns are kind of a reddish brown. So that kind of grays it out because what happens is when you start adding these tones in, they'll start neutralizing themselves a little bit. So because I want to play in gray and I don't have like a hard gray on the palette. So this is how you mix this up. It's actually pretty fun. Once you kind of get comfortable with how you see how it's kind of a cool grayish tone. And so what I'll do is I'll come over here to Mr. Model, dude. And this will be more of the pure color because I've just mixed most of it up. And I'm gonna place it directly where I want it, which is right at the edge of that open, uh, the edge of that hatch. And so this is just kind of, it's a really light thing, get a little bit more thinner. And this is kind of a filter now. Same color way, just kind of pushing it outwards. So I've got the stronger 
Whoops. Ooh. Just <laughs> so I try to point. With the nails. Let's blend that out real quick. And anytime that happens, just just come in with your blender brush and blend it out. So now I want a little bit more. I want a little bit more greasy blue, Panzer gray, greasy Panzer gray color. So a little bit more black and blue in that mix that I just did. Dry it on the paper towel because I want it a little bit less thinner. There's already thinner down on the model. Just kind of gently stipple right up to the edge of that panel line. So this is where you start to be a little bit of the artist. So, but it's still fairly translucent. It's not like a really, really opaque. So there's, there's more transparency in there than you think. So blend this out, switch brushes to the blender. And I'm, I'll go real slow. I'm taking the tip of that right in the in the edge of that pattern and pulling vertically towards the nose of the model. So if I speed up my hand again, it's a little bit of the jiggity jiggity shake. But I but what I'm doing is I'm not touching the oils that I put by the, the actual panel line. So that, that's how you blend that out to where you leave that oil in the next to the joint or the panel line, and then you start weathering it a little bit the other way. Looks like there's some dust speckles in here that's creating an interesting little pattern here. <laughs> There's something on the model. There's little specks or something in there. I don't know why it's, it's getting a little, a little interesting breakup right there behind the headlight, which is fine. We'll work with it. Whatever, whatever's going on, we're fine. Uh, Forest Ghost, are you doing that tonal contrast via thin oil filter by adding opacity with a warmer tone? Um, let me read that again. Are you doing that tonal contrast with thin? Yes, yes, and or adding opacity with a warmer tone? Um, so I'm building up the opacity via the thin layers in kind of a filter on filter conversation and I'm adjusting the warm and the cool by the by basically the blue that I'm using on the palette so either I'm adding blue to make it cooler or I'm not adding blue and this letting the, the the browns and whites and grays that I'm using be their natural tone and then I'm cooling it down into a panzer gray blue with a little bit of blue into it that's kind of what I'm doing with that and then I'm applying them in the, in the thin layers does that kind of make sense does that answer that yeah, the jiggity jiggities. It's the, I, the coffee shake, you know, um, and I'm old, so it's easy for my hands. <laughs> I can get it going pretty quick. Yeah. But that's what that is. And it works pretty well, but but I wanted to slow that down so you can see, because really what's happening, it's just the tip of that bristle right there, which is why we love these number twos, um, that they can do this. And I'm just, it's just a little bit of like, it's a little bit of a, a shake back and forth. And, I, and, the, and the motion's more this way. Just a, it's just like a little tight frequency of motion and that kind of blends. So that way, because I only have that region of space to blend in, it's really tight. You'll, you'll get that around the model. You'd be surprised how often that happens. So you have to kind of figure out the hand motion and that's, that's how you do that. And by the, but the turntable, I get that angle just right. Cause if you try to do it nose on like this, it's really hard. But if you, if you do it kind of sideways, that's a lot more natural motion for you, for you to, to work with. Because it's not a vertical stipple, it's it's a horizontal stipple, if that makes sense too. Yeah, because when I turn it, like this is awkward this way. But you can see I've worked, you know, I've worked this section here a little bit. Let's get a little bit more streakiness in there, a little bit more directional. I always think they're just a slight kick down on those fenders, you know, like how fluids will just naturally leak that way a little bit more. And then I'm just going to check the edge of the fender here. So what I like to do, actually what I like to do on the, on the fender edges, on Panzer threes, fours, Stugs, and the like, and the ilk. So because I like to weather them towards the end, they tend to get a little bit hand polished through here because that's kind of a grabbing point. That's a natural thing because it just, I don't have the setup for, uh, you know, com competition level work. I'm just kind of messing around with it. And that's fine because you'll never see this stuff. I mean, you might as a judge, but most people don't, so it's no big deal. But with a lot of the whites worn away, you can come back in. It's just, just on the edge of this, just kind of build up some of these. This is the fun part of a whitewash. Kind of 
kind of randomly build up like I do at the at the fender brakes between the panels just kind of naturally break it up and, and and let one panel be a little bit stronger and this is a little bit more in the artist side of life so this is really just dabbing on really thin thin layers of white so I'm at the so this is where I think the iPhone 13 will really I'm at the edge of the the two times zoom I've got on this on this camera so I think that's where the the newer setup is going to be worth my investment to get that and, and, and it'll improve this part of it because this is what I really want you guys to see is is if you can really understand what's going on the tip of these bristles um, you can take any brush you know it doesn't have to be these but I mean you can you can take any brush any paint and you'll up your game just by the quality of your brushwork so I think that's going to be an important little thing but they're just doing a little bit of bumping up on the white there I do that quite often. I do it more towards the end is because is I'm going to still keep, I'm not going to do too much. I'm going to keep touching. We'll get back over here. So let's finish off this front fender right there for now. I can zoom out. You can see kind of what we've done here. Let's zoom out. So, and this is, again, real quick, is just the simple weathering here and a little bit I've done over here because it matches kind of the colorways up here. I'm controlling all my stuff that I'm doing by the fact that I'm basically really uh have done the hard part before and each time you do a new section you've done kind of the hard part because the next section actually gets a little bit easier because when your familiarity builds up you know you kind of get in a real flow and a real rhythm um i did all of this over you know maybe an hour and a half last night just getting in the flow getting in the rhythm about it and it just goes pretty quick and i just go panel by panel by panel by panel uh, same here i've done this i've done a little bit of this i've put a little bit of this i'm kind of missing this little spot under the model here it's a little bit tough to get to on camera so i'm just not going to worry about it and we'll just do this last bit right here for now and then i'll move on to something fun something else we've got about an hour left anyway so that's what's going on that's what we doing that's what we've been doing let's see here my biggest problem now is that guy's in an awkward spot because I want to have them the other way, but that's off camera because the camera's set for this. I have to do it this way. I will suffer. I will suffer from my soup. Okay, so same general idea. I like a lot of the white that's hidden under that thing. So let's kind of light it light to dark again, go a little bit dirty, grimy on the edges. It's a little bit too wet, it's no big deal. Blend that, kind of blending inward, outward. So from this under the headlight, back towards the edge of the fender, kind of pushes that dirt tone over to the edge. You can see how wet that kind of looks. It's more wet than I want it, but that's a super fast fix, my friend. And you know what's coming next. Pop the hair dryer on that as I bump everything in sight first. Because I never bump anything when I'm off camera. It's only when I'm on camera. That is the curse, right? Yeah, my tripod has a uh, phone rail, uh, not a phone rail, a, a camera rail, so that you can slide the camera left to right to do a pan shot. And I mount everything to that, because that's what the clamp fits over. Sorry to kind of jimmy rig that up. So there's your quick little, it's still a little bit shiny, shiny. Let's, let's knock that down. Just throw the brush around too while we're at it. Get a little bit more white. So when I want to knock something down, I want to I want to get a little bit like a really thin like wash level of just like a dusty tan color. Just a little bit of white here. Get a little bit of this kind of peachy flesh tone. So just a hint of brown. It's a little bit too much thinner. Not quite enough paint. You guys have that where the, the weather app basically lies to you? Like it's way warmer today than it keeps setting it was gonna be. Kind of weird. I always think there's a little Homer Simpson dude at the at the in the phone weather app that's like eating his donuts, not paying attention to what's going on. Cause it is not high 60s today. It is mid 70s pushing almost 80 degrees. So 
I've applied a little bit more, switched to the blender brush, jiggity jiggy that edge of that a little bit, leaving kind of a pattern under the headline a little bit, because I want to keep some of that pure white. I kind of like that pop of color. I'm going to use that pop of color to my advantage. And that's what I was talking about with some of the other panels, like these guys up over here, like this little guy here, by almost not touching it, leaving its kind of pre-painted worn look uh, alone, but in weathering around it, it kind of weathers itself, if that makes sense. So by not weathering it, kind of weather, I think Marino brought that up one time. Joe asked, hey Mike, will you do any OPR weathering the road wheels? Go straight to pigments, asking for a friend. Um, depends on the subject. Are you talking specifically on the Stug? If you are, then it will be pigments first because you're just gonna cover it. Now what you're doing, Joe, because I think you're going on your Tiger One question, um, you're gonna lose some of that. No big deal. Like I told you before, it's a rite of passage. I think every good armor modeler should weather all the tank Tiger One wheels at least once in their life. Um, I will not bemoan that process. Uh, but anytime you have a road wheel conversation and you're trying to determine the dust level of what you're trying to do, you know, because you don't have any pigments on the model at, at this point in time yet, Joe, you're going to see that um, go as far as you want with that because th there is experience being gained at, at hand over foot as you each road wheel you do, you're getting a little bit better. Um, but you will notice that when you start throwing some pigments down, you'll lose some of that, that work, which is no big deal because you'll have the little, some of it will show through a little bit. Um, pigments tend to be a little bit on the coverage heavy side of life. So you're going to lose some of it. But as you guys have probably seen throughout, I layer and layer and layer and layer and layer and layer. There's no, there's no time where I'm just kind of one and done. I think, I think probably here alone, just in the oil color conversation was probably three or four layers. So that's three or four layers up here. All of these are multiple layers for sure. This is five or six layers up top to build up that just thinness of just trying to, and you can see how the colors shift as you, as you rotate through the light catches it. You see some of the, I did some white speckling. You've seen a little bit of like snow white camo speckling in here, just to kind of bring back some kind of random whiteness to it a little bit, a little bit more gritty. I should, you know, I meant to talk about that. Remind me guys, I'll do, I'll talk about him in a, in, in a future stream. Peter Sarson, Sarson, S-A-R-S-O-N, Peter Sarson. He is one of Osprey's um, illustrators in the Osprey manuals. Uh, some of you may be familiar, may not be familiar. You've probably seen his work if you have any Osprey, um, you know, a book on the Churchill, book on the Krama, book on the Panther, whatever. Steve Zaloger's written a lot and, and done a lot of illustration work, but Peter Sarson is a common hired illustrator in um, Osprey's world back in the day. And I really like his illustrative style of weathering with his painting, which is kind of a watercolor he translucent. It's kind of like what I'm doing. It's a little bit, I call it kind of in my head a little bit. I have some Peter Sarson prints. I should, I should bring them on stream and show you what I'm talking about. Uh, I'll grab one next time for sure. Um, did that answer you, Joe? Yeah, just do it, man. You know, that's kind of hard, hard of it is also if you're, if you're just kind of on the fence about it, you, you know, you've got a billion road wheels to play with. Just take the ones by the inside of the hole and just start doing that and see what happens. And then, you know, layer your oils back up on top. So has a lot of panel breaks. How do you approach tonal shifts across larger expansive models of say a fuselage? Well, okay, so in the tank conversation, because um, you do kind of see it because of how humans interact with the top of the vehicles quite a bit. Now the, the gaps of the panels are the gaps of the plastic panels. And that's the, I think the biggest weakness of aircraft and it's not the modeler's fault at all, and it's not technology's fault per se, but how aircraft models are made. Um, and when you study the planes, very few of them, I'd say probably anything pre matte coated jet fighter going back to World War II don't get nearly as quilted out as this. So, um, but anything of questions of that nature for us is gonna be based off a of reference. It's gonna be, you know, if you're just doing a Spitfire, for example, you have to study the Spits or the Hurricanes, the, the Ferry Battles and, and, and the Bow Fighters and all that stuff, the Jimmy Jams and the Sterlings and the Lancasters to see how British aircraft weather out and, and look how your panel breaks are, um, the type of paint they use, the type of weather they fly in. Um, it can be a little bit different to Desert Africa Corps and, you know, doing P-40s out of Africa or doing, you know, Corsairs out of the Solomon's Islands. You've got to, you know, Hellcats on a carrier in 44, 45. You got to really play up your references to really understand what that kind of paint, like if it's a gloss navy paint, what it's going to do, 
how it's going to react between the panel lines. And if you really want to get good at that and understanding how those fade out, you know, because a, a folk wolf, you know, 190D versus a 190A, three or four years apart versus a TH-152 versus a Yak in Russia, they all play out a little bit different because they're different constructions. A mosquito, the panel breaks. Um, so this is probably, this this would be extreme for an aircraft. If I saw aircraft like this, I, I would I'd question a little bit. Um, but I've seen enough armor to know that you can get pretty close to this look. So, um, but if you have this, if say for say for example, say for shits and giggles, you don't like this or whatever. A, a couple ways to go about that is to dust down a, a fresh white wash right on top of that. Um, and what I mean by that is, so if we look at this real quick, um, I've done this a few times. And this is to harmonize it, and it's kind of an expanded conversation of filtering. Um, okay, so let's go back here, stage here. So this is kind of the same conversation, because it is winter whitewash related. So I was at this stage here. This is 70 second scale Panzer IV. And then this is intentionally designed as almost like a pre-shaded layer, though, because I knew I was going to go back over this. But in the same context of what Forrest asking about, if I want to calm that down a little bit, what I did was I painted a whole nother layer on top of that, leaving that quilted work a little bit underneath. It's kind of appreciated uh, conversation, if you will. So you could you could you could calm anything down. Like like if say this wasn't going the way you wanted it to. Even though I'm I actually really like this. I love this one. I don't have a problem with it. I don't. This doesn't seem extreme to me at all, uh, given what I've seen of Winter Stugs um, in in Russia. And there is, a, I actually should pull that color photo out. Uh, there's a, one on Instagram going around right now that's the top of a, I think it's a Panther, I think it might be a Tiger One even, or a Panther A. It's got that old flat cupola on the, on the side of it. But it, it's a whitewash and it's in color and you see the first two or three feet of the top of the turret pretty well. And it does appear that kind of scuffy, scratchy look, um, which is kind of what you're seeing in here. So which is kind of like this look on this panel right in here, you see a lot of that. So it's. I'm well enough to know that I think we're pretty cool with that. But if this say you didn't like it, just dust down a really thin layer of, of fresh whitewash and just, you know, let it let it peek through and you'll kind of combine the two between yeah, we're doing a bunch of wagon wheels today, Zach. I got a whole stack over here for you. <laughs> Mr. Grizzle. Uh Sylvain, how are you? Ah, uh, you know, it's okay. So if you've missed the stream, the first hour was literally me talking about the oil paints and the brushes. So you didn't miss much. And I didn't, I've been kind of fucking around with the painting today. So I haven't done a ton of painting, but we've kind of weathered this. We've gone through here. We've gone over here, a little bit of back over here. Uh, and just kind of talking about as, as we get to the, the near end of this. And you can see what happens too is, is, and I talk about this a little bit, things I've not weathered that kind of become their own thing. And I've, I've I mentioned it a few times today. So. I don't want to overweather this section, and I like kind of the contrast I'm having here in some of the some of the panels by little to no weathering some of this stuff, and then kind of building up colors around things too is another way to build up the story levels. Um, and meaning because this area in here is is relatively untouched that to get stuff into that corner, and there's not a lot of grease and grime that's getting up and over into that section unless somebody human wise comes in and spills his coke right on top of that joint, if that makes sense. Uh, so I try to leave, so I'm trying to do something like these hatches here are flipped open almost all the time. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm playing up some of this stuff. But by, by kind of not weathering super much in here and, in, and into here, I do have some random scratch right there. I can fix that, but... So these kind of little ideas are good because it, it also teaches you don't have to see like I didn't really weather under the, the headlight here at all, but it's got a nice because I've weathered around it. So that's another way to play that stuff up without um, stressing yourself out. Let it build up naturally. It's kind of an organic weathering. If you, it's organically developing the relationship of the paint to the model, guys. That's <laughs> what we're doing. No, but that's that's kind of what I'm thinking about is, is like I like the interplay of so over here, I really kind of weathered up under where my brush is up under there. But as I spin back, when I look at over in here, uh, I've, I've actually almost done almost nothing, but it's, it's a, when you look at the model from above, you still get a nice weathered feel without every section having to be, and that's kind of, that goes to asymmetry. Um, that goes to, I will probably do a little bit more under this, but I'm not gonna go anywhere near what I did over here. 
uh, just because I like kind of the storytelling and what, what I've got going on right now. So I, I, if you're happy with something, it's totally fine to leave it too as well. You don't have to always go nine tenths on every section. So that's kind of part of that, what that was, that story. So yeah, we got, we got quite a bit done. For all the bullshit today, I still have to do a little bit of weathering under the tools. It's just a pain in the butt. And sometimes pain in the butt stuff, I just push off. <laughs> God, I don't want to deal with it right now. Yeah, it's just going to be tough to get the camera and stuff in there. But we can here just, oops, that's the blender. Do a little bit. Hello, Drew. How are you? Yeah, oh yeah, that's Sylvain. You'll have to rewatch all that conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking with King Art. Uh, as we as we have this conversation, say Sean, excuse me. Get the hiccups again. But yeah, let's get a little bit. Of let's take one. Let's let's. It's not a little bit more. I haven't used this orange color yet. It's a little bit more bright than the 502 orange, which is fine. And there's a little bit of this kind of lemon yellow. I haven't used, really used these yellows and oranges yet. Let's see what we get out of this here. Are we zoomed in? Can we zoom in more? I feel like we can zoom in more. Okay, we've got some old rust in here. Mm. We're gonna fresh rush the edge of this shovel a little bit. Almost no thinner, just a little bit of paint. That happens sometimes. My blender brush wasn't quite dry enough. It's a little bright. Out there. talk about putting down really thin light layers it's a little bit more opaque but that's still a pretty thin layer of paint and what we can do once that guy's down come back in with a little raw umber it's kind of your dark steel metal color a little bit to hint of black to it get to dry the tip off of the brush pretty good so I've got kind of a nice sharp tip now brush around the edges of this guy. You calm that down a little bit and then you got a little bit of the of a worn edge to it. And you have kind of a fresh surface rust. This is me just kind of experimenting a little bit. Not that shovels don't do this, but just uh, with the colors. So put again. It's it, to repeat myself, but from before, put the light um, light tones down first, and then build the dark layers on top. So I zoom back out a little bit. It does yeah? It doesn't look quite as it, when you zoomed in. It looks a little contrasty, but it's not. So there's a little bit of just pop, popping that back. Just a little bit more visual, visual interest. A little dark brown, kind of maybe knock some of that orange down just a, just a smidge. 
There's just a little bit of a rusty edge to that upper part of the shovel as it sits there. Question, if I'm in a Soviet vehicle of any era, is your Allied book better or one of the modern armor? Uh, that's a fair question. Um, no, because they do play up differently. You know, Soviet modern, Soviet armor is a different conflicts and they're not usually um, portrayed in terms of that conversation as in country, in terms of in Russia. And Russia country terrain, theater, weather is its own special thing. So um, if your intention is it just there's and that's why I had to, I had to make that decision on that one, because it's uh, it's 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 why modern armor book exists. Uh, is World War II is a really contained conversation um, because it happens in very specific areas. But modern conflicts, you know, um, I'm not showing you, for example, just by contrast, I'm not showing you an M1 Abrams, even though they're they're peacetime ones. You know, the ones that are in action are all in the desert. So it's it's kind of like yeah, I can't put that in the ally book, so to speak. So it's kind of a weird compilation of how do I put. That's one of the more challenging aspects of breaking down the books. That's I, I could almost do you know a, a much much broader tank art series where it en entails you know breaking certain countries down into their eras as well and i just decided against it um so it just depends on what your focus would be uh, super dry beef you know if your intentions t-34s js2s um you know t-26s t-28s uh grab the allied one but if you're t-55 t-62 72 and grab the mod that's i would just do it that way it's going to be the easiest answer I mean, they'll both give you all good information, don't get me wrong. The books are awesome, my friend. Yeah, I'm not gonna tell you no. But yeah, that's what I would probably do if I had to lean one way or the other. Uh, Tank R3 is a superb book because it probably covers the, the broadest spectrum of finishes. That's probably what I'd be doing. breaker bar here. I'm going to put a little bit of a thin rust down on the flat parts. Zoom in, get a little closer. <laughs> so I'm just kind of doing a little bit of detail painting, a little bit of just kind of, of tweaking some stuff. I do this often when I'm working on my own anyway. I kind of go through and you'll find that sometimes you just get stuff done. Like I don't really have like a tool painting session per se. I'm bummed though, now that I have those T-Rex handles, I, I don't have them on the model though. The model to do to me is like, dude, I'd really want those those handles on. But I have to pull all the, I'd have to break all the tools off and everything, that's just not gonna happen. This model's not that important enough for me to do that. Sometimes you might do that. You might be able to safely pull those, pop those off, replace some parts if you had to. Anything damaged can be fixed, my friend. Uh, Mike was super chatty today. Yeah, they're more than usual though. Uh, if your streams lead to my divorce, do you have a spare room? I don't, Joe. You're on your own, brother. Uh, in fact, if I had my way and I could afford it, I would have one. I'm a, I'm a loft guy. Like if you guys haven't picked up on that that whole, uh, I would like like I'm an open floor plan. Everybody hates my couch too. I love it. I'm like yeah, that nobody that means nobody's nobody's spending the night. Everybody's getting a hotel room. Yeah, I'm a terrible host. <laughs> uh, apartment living. Yeah, I did. I felt a little bit bad about that because I had a this this apartment's not too bad. This is this is a, a nice two bedroom. This is the spare room, Joe. So this is actually the office. So um, it'd be tough to turn this into a sleep unless somebody wants to sleep in a sleep bag <laughs> on the floor. But Samson Samson Wu, if you guys know who he is, he hasn't modeled in a long time. Uh, scale modeled in a long time uh, from Taiwan. Chinese friend, um, not Bayan Wu, but Sam Samson Wu. Um, visited. Uh, Really, this. And if, let me try to think here. If you guys remember, uh, he's done some some beautiful military stuff. But his his kind of claim to fame a few years ago, Samson's. Uh, he did the hover Volkswagens, the transporters, the, the buses, where he levitated them. He used offsetting earth magnets that push against each other, and he levitated a VW bus that was kind of uh, with a, like a hover engine, kind of a futuristic, apocalyptic. Did a series of them, really really cool. 
he did a worldwide trip where he couch surfed his way around planet earth you know and he came to portland but i felt bad because I, I literally don't have a couch and it was my my office my at the time in that apartment was my workbenches um and then i had a couple chairs <laughs> I'm like yeah you, you, there, there's a hostel down the road though you can, i felt really bad but we hung out we had a good night i took him to dinner and stuff and, and everything uh excellent modeler though um i think he's also in the in the in the car design industrial design profession so i think he's that's what he went that's why he hasn't scale modeled in a wall he, he picked up a new gig and it, it got real intense over there for him in terms of work work workability but anywho yeah, I'm just kind of judging the tools a little bit. They're they're different enough. That rust on the shovel probably looks hard, stronger on stream. In person, it doesn't look. It looks a little bit better. So I'm just trying to keep this weathering a little bit simpler on the, on the, under the tools. And I do that in most of my Stugs and Panzer threes. I've noticed. I always find when you try to really weather around tools, it, it, it turns into a shit show. So I try to use the tool bracks as, as kind of a focal point of, of dirt collection and kind of run it. As, I find a little bit of the, the, the cliched less is more with tool stowage areas on, on the grills, Nash horns, any of, those, any of those where they collect them in the fence, Shermans. Just let the tools kind of be weathered and then kind of just do a little bit around them. And I think that's usually, in my opinion, visually enough. You know, just a couple little simple pin washes, nothing fancy. I actually never really do a ton on the fire extinguishers. I think the actual initial chipping work uh, is usually good enough a little bit. And then I just do a little tonal variation. And that's kind of that thin glaze look right there. A little bit of a, of a warm uh, gray oil just over the top of that. Angry train. I'm sure you guys all hear that. This is your classic little pin wash here. It's getting a little bit on the too much thinner down, so let's dry that off. And that's a nice demonstration too of how matte the oils dry. You know, we have those conversations, guys think that the oil paints always dry glossy and stuff like this, but this this is such a tried and true, I've been doing this for a decade, this is such a tried and true process. Like I've never had a problem with greasy, with, with shiny oils. Am I missing anything? <laughs> you my, my boy blue. Well, just don't get a divorce, Joe, and we'll be, we'll be good to go. <laughs> Besides, you're in Florida, dude. We didn't do come all the way over to Portland. What are you thinking? No, if I if I make one more, I'm, I've got enough moves left in me. I'm, I'm actually thinking of maybe a new city in the future if I do a move here in the in the next, I don't know, group of time. My parents are retired up here and they're they're doing really well and having a good time. My mom texted me the other day. They were on the they have this little lake in front of their cabin in the Pacific Northwest where they, they've kind of retired a little bit and she was on the lake floating around for three hours. It was beautiful weather here. Even though I'm bitching about it, it was it was uh, it's only because it's not what it's supposed to, it's not what they told us it would be. But yeah. So I, I think I've got a move in me. I might go back east if I do. I think it's, I've visited enough to know it'd be worth it'd be worth a few. And I, I'm a little bit nomadic. I'm one of those people that is a little bit on the nomadic side. I don't I don't I, I don't mind moving every three, four, five, six years. It's been nine years here, ten years here, so I don't I don't have any qualms about that. I spent forty in L.A., so I'd, I'd had enough of that place. I ain't going back to the demise of many. Y'all can have your L.A. to yourself. 
But yeah, I wouldn't mind going back east. I'm just kind of slightly dirtying up the lower edge of this, just getting a little bit of grime under there like I was talking about. It doesn't have to be much. The brush, it's a, this, these are those tricky spots where it's that diamond plate texture on the fender and it doesn't really want to play with you too much. Let me try one of these little mopper dudes out. A little stipple in there, kind of diffuse that. Kind of that knocked it down a little bit. Just want a hint, just a smidge. Yeah, this is where I'm at the point now where you, you be real careful because you, you can overdo something really fast in a heartbeat. In fact, this spot here, which is my, this one I think, hold on. We'll do a little bit more train love here in a sec. I'll show you the Gundam things here too. I haven't forgotten. The, the pattern of this of this cloud breakup kind of, I think I, I showed some other layers on it. Let's put a little bit more white down. Hazard with the direction, not super concerned, but just breaking up that darker gray. That's yeah, a little bit nicer looking. So what I did there was this is a good conversation, real quick, and then we'll move on. I'll get to you guys here real quick. I see y'all. Um, was I kind of had had been work? Part of it was showing a technique, but I evaluated. I didn't like the breakup of the dark to the white that was next to it, so I took a little bit of the white and kind of came back in and killed. You can see as I rotate around, I've kind of knocked that the shape of it out, just with some thin translucent white. And that's what I was doing right there, and I'm much happier with that look. In my defense, there's a lot of good brushwork I've shown in my chattiness today, <laughs> to be fair. Uh, hey, me and the wife want to visit Portland. What's the best time to go? Fall and spring are the two best times in Portland. Although it's a four season region. Um, our summers are, even though we had some records, aren't as hot as some like Phoenix summers, but um, fall and spring are the best. Um, fall's my favorite. Uh, just because I like cooler temps myself, but spring is probably the fan favorite. Uh, stay away from Jersey. Or, yeah, I know all about that. Um, I, I do Brooklyn though, to be honest with you. Um, but I'm from LA. I, I know all about high taxes, so I'm not super concerned about that. Um, but just to experience it, I think it's you know I, I like the fact that you know it may not be Jersey, but I you know I wouldn't mind maybe doing areas near Pittsburgh, you know, because I'm a Steeler fan. It'd be fun to live. By. The one thing I haven't done as where I lived is be next to the sport. You know, we have the Blazers right behind me, but I'm just not the biggest basketball fan. I just you know I'm just not. Football's my game, and we don't have it up here. I mean, I've gone to see a couple of Seahawks games. Uh, but that's that's a that's a three hour drive. Yeah. Uh, what are we talking about away from the question? Here? But yeah, that would be my uh, it's a great eating and drinking city. Uh, I think I've talked about this before. It is a really fun city to visit. Hey, Mike, what did you stream? Oh, yeah, no. Uh, what else we got? Did I miss any other questions? Oh, if I'm not in this. Yeah, we got you super drive. Did I answer you, though, on that? That go well. Tell me more about phones. Just kidding. Join the wisdom you're spitting out. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. Question, how do you deal with getting oil and pigments into a hard-to-reach area? I have tracks and roadways in front of the whole walls that need to get to. Are they attached, Pans, Pans or Dan? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, I have tracks and roadways in the front of the whole side walls. Are you talking the nose of the panther under the front of it a little bit? Now, if your tracks are on, uh, that's a, just a yoga pose. You got to really kind of get your, your angles and distorted things. Just, uh, I would say for you, Dan, on that, um, pretend you're a judge and, and get your camera phone light out and take certain angles and kind of see, okay, well, I need to weather that because I'll see that. Some of that you may not see, so don't sweat it too much, but figure out what you have to do. Um, you know, if you've already got the material on, there's not a lot you can do, but just work on what's visible and don't sweat the rest because nobody else will see it either. Oh, let's see what else. Did I miss anything else? Uh, Forrest asks, would that be an 80% thinner to mix, to, to spray that? What did I miss? Okay, so I'm sorry, Forrest, I didn't answer you completely. The overall filter might be what I need for the, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. My bad, my apologies. Um, yeah. Uh, start less is more, Forrest. So 80% thinner sounds fair. 
for what you're trying to do. If you're going to mist over, say, a color to, to knock down what's below it, um, definitely work your way slow into that. Uh, then again, let's, let's be honest with ourselves here since it's the day of honesty. Um, if you fuck up an overspray and it's too much and you, you basically have kicked your weathering back down to, say, a base painting, you just have to start over. <laughs> It's not the end of the world. You get mad, whatever. Well, you know, knock it up. I got to weather some more. So that's the worst of it is you kind of just have had too much paint. So that's actually the of, of a bad problem to have. That's not a bad problem to have, to be truthful. You just have to do a little bit more weathering. Um, and if and if the lower levels are, and I've said this many times before, if your lower levels of paint are in, in a point of where the, the quality of the work, say for just for shits and giggles, I didn't like this. The quality of the paint works fine. I can throw another layer of white on top of that and re-weather it. I'm going to be fine. So if the quality of the paint works good, um, come check Cincinnati. Oh, Ohio's got some nice spots. Um, I, I've heard some, uh, just in like, you know, you read about travel shit that, that Pittsburgh is kind of a Portland-esque city. Cause I like food and in the, in the, in the, in the, 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 the vibrant restaurant scene is what I think makes a good city. It's, you got kind of stuff to do. Like I'm not moving there to sit in my house and watch TV, like that whole thing. So I like history and all the things you guys like, you know, you want to see the region. And of course it's beautiful and it's, it's East coast. Uh, trees and stuff compared to the West Coast trees and stuff, which is that's what I liked about Portland. Uh, but Austin grabbed Tank Art 3 recently, and that thing is the tomb. It is. There's a lot of shit. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff in there. Um, yeah. As you can see how chatty I am, I'm also real wordy in the books, if you haven't picked up on that. All right, we're good. Let's get this guy out of here. Let's, let's enough with the Stug. But you guys understood I do good enough for this, and we've got enough uh, love with this guy today. Let me zoom out a little bit. That's a pretty solid piece right now. It's in the last 80%, but so yeah. So I just have to do a little bit of work in here. I'll do that off camera and I just have to do this. The the, the snow was supposed to be here today. Uh, I just didn't even bother with it. So the, the woodland scenic stuff should be here for the next stream. And I'm hoping Sunday stream, uh, we can get some snow on this and the tracks on this and we can, we can, that's where I've been kind of messing around a little bit, but the oil work because the King Art oil showed up and the brushes showed up. So we just continued on was kind of the, the, the plan. So pull him aside. Let me, let's talk about this real quick. So what I did on this dude. Um, oh yeah. No break. Oh, what I was going to say. Okay, the side of the hole, I removed the side skirt and the weather and redo. Okay. Yeah, you just, if it's all in place, I've, I've been in that position before where you have to weather with stuff in that kind of, it's been on a 40 scale Panther, to be honest with you. I've, I've, yeah, it's, it's not fun. You know, less, just, just throw a couple little things up in there, Dan, a little bit of dust, a little bit of oil, so maybe dust some pigments up in there or something, some speckles, some splashes, call it a day. Probably, you're never probably going to see it anyway. Um, do this for a little, maybe sell a few books. Yeah, we'll see. Apparently the compressor just kicked on. So this dude here is this is the Gundam Heat Sword 1144 scale. This is probably 40, 45, 50 foot type battle sword for a robot. Some paint came off of the Tamiya tape there. That's where my little alligator clips were gripping it. Um, so I've just been kind of we've been as you guys have been seeing been kind of playing with this back and forth. So I've got one of the blues down for kind of a, a heat discoloration. I'm gonna do a, just a hint of a rainbow effect. So let's put in a little bit of a warm kind of reddish gold uh, oil up along that blue. And gives it kind of that little bit of a look. I don't know if Two Hands is in the chat today. He sent me some pics of a similar little, uh, how they heat tempered some swords and it kind of had this effect to it. So it kind of works. I was debating airbrushing it, but I like the grittiness of what I've got going on because uh, it's going to match the whole piece. Because if it's not, it's not really a jet exhaust because it, you know, uh, for comparison's sake, an F4 Phantom which or an F100 or something, the size of the exhaust is probably about the size of that, that hilt right there. So this piece is the size of a whole wing. So I'm trying to play this up a little different versus an airbrush look. If you guys are, you understand the principles, you know where I'm going with that. But let's just show you some, some put some oils down. So I've got the, you see that little blue line right in there. I've got kind of this faded, gritty, dusty, discolored line in there, kind of oxidized metal, if you will. So let me see here how this goes. I might F this up. But I need kind of a, oh, we've got our little violet right there. Okay, yeah, let's lose, use some of it. I need some more thinner though first. I did order more thinner too, by the way. I've been chewing through this. I haven't done this much oil work in years. 
This is how I used to work this this much volume. I'd do two or three sessions a week. Just BTW. Back in the day. Four or five projects at a time. Oh yeah, I was used to paint a bunch. Okay, had to put a little bit more fresh thinner in there. Okay, what was the color? Okay, we're gonna do a little kind of we're gonna go from the blue, we're gonna put a little bit of a we have a little bit of this violet color here. And then we're gonna get a little of this crimson and scarlet colors over here. This might be we'll see how this we'll see how this goes, my friend. So any situation like this where I'm for the first time replicating the, the heat tempering of, a, of metal like this. It's not my thing. I won't lie. <laughs> we're being honest today, right guys? I feel like we're in therapy today. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. I'm gonna draw the kind of a purple red line right below the blue line. And I'm, I'm going really cautious just to make sure this comes off the way it's supposed to. And I think it is. So this is what I talk about. You move a little bit gentle, a little bit slow. There's literally no rush to this. There's just, it's just a hint of purple reddish tone to this. And I'm gonna build this up slow. And what I did was I kind of used the cloudiness of the, of the oxidation as kind of a pattern. And then I kind of edged it just visually looking at it. And that's how I came up with this shape. And that was from the stippling that I did from the previous weathering work from the other video or stream that we did. And it's a very translucent layer. There's almost no paint, no thinner. You can see how like the tip of the brush is like just almost has nothing on it. But this is that type of precise work. So that looks good right there. See how we get just a hint of purple? And I'll have to blend some of this. So this is that rainbow discoloration you see with, with the, the heated exhaust and other things of this of this ilk. Ilk's a good word to ilk is the word of the day. What I use with my buddy the other day. I called him recalcitrant. <laughs> it's like what you say. Oh. Uh, here, I'll share some stories with you guys. You guys will like this. So back in the day, so you all know uh, Ampersand is in Florida, Delray Beach, and I was in LA at the time. And so there would be, this is before Zoom, this is before this, but this is working remotely because we were doing the military miniatures and review remotely, the Armor Magazine, Pat Stansel and I, before, I think Spud, well, Spud was around too. Spud came in, John Murphy came in. And uh, Pat, Pat's a wordsmith. If you don't know Pat Stanzel, he's a, he's a wordsmith and he loves all that stuff. And I'd always argue with him so because I have my way, obviously I started RSP, so I have my ways about how I wanted to do things. And, and that's how a lot of that stems from my experience with that. Uh, and that's how we work in life, right? We, you know, you develop your skills and stuff from your previous job and you bring them into your new jobs. Or in my case, I started, you know, my own books. Um, he'd always call me recalcitrant. He goes, Michael, you're being so recalcitrant today. Uh, it's good stuff. Yeah, we were we were in uh, outskirts of Folkston at Euro Militaire, and I was when I was representing uh, Ampersand. So Pat and I, we go to dinner. We find this little British cafe. It's you know night out, and they bring us like a little appetizer, and it's and it's a total Seinfeld moment. There's a dip, and there's like bread or chips or whatever it was. And he looked at me deadpan and, you know, I don't think we'd ever eaten food together. We are thousands of miles apart, so we usually are never really, like, hanging out together. <laughs> he goes, you better not double dip that. And I just, like, lose my shit because I'm just thinking it's that George Costanza episode where you double dips the chip. And that was accusing me before I even did it. So I've added a little bit more of a warmer tone. I'm really going slow with this, obviously. Just a hint. I don't want it like super beach up in the face. I want just a, just a smidge of it. Just getting some colors down. Uh, a little bit is off stream, Sylvain. We did, um, I did this side off stream. I did this side on stream. All of this was on stream. What I added, Sylvain, in between streams was this blue, this, this, uh, 
blue discoloration, this heat uh, tempering result. Uh, I'm trying to get kind of, and I'm trying not to see, it, it's starting, I'm at that, you'd be really careful right now where this may not look believable. So I have to be really cautious as, as kind of like, I have to come back in here and let me get my little, um, what are we calling these dudes? The mini mop. So the, the stippler brush, stippler, <laughs> stippling brush. Uh, this is the newer one I've got today. The, the, the mini mop. Oh, Drew, you're a man. I appreciate that. Um, mini mop. So what I'm going to do is, so I've got that colored down. Let me get the, let me get the thinner out of this. And again, in case I haven't been clear about that, really keep your blender guys clear of paint You really keep the blenders just for thinners. And I'm trying to get a, like a, like a 95% dry stippling brush. There's a, just a hint, a smidge, tiny, tiny amount. You almost don't see it. See, I just leaves a little bit of a sheen on my on my fingers though. So come over to here. Oops, let me refocus that. I'm, I'm used to looking back at it. So now I'm just trying to hold that gentle like, and I'm just gonna gently stipple. It killed it a little bit, but it kind of blends it in a little bit. It softens the kind of yellowy orange I put down. Just a gentle, gentle love tap. And the gentleness is really crucial. And I mean that for a lot of us because, you know, a lot of you guys are big, strong dudes, you know, gorilla hands. When I say gentle, like I'm just kissing that. That is like a feather tickle of, on the paint. There's there's no scrubbing. There's no pushing into that. It's just let that thinner and on the brush. You can just see it right here. See how the transfer is just that hint. That's what I'm, super subtle because that'll give you that, that soft uh, diffuse look right there. And the, and the heat distemper, uh, distempering, the heat tempering that discolors that gives you that kind of wavy look of, of kind of, uh, that's a little bit like mapping. I have to keep working this a little bit. It's not quite there. What did I miss? And back in the days of VLS, Bob, Le oh yeah, absolutely, Timothy, there you go. Uh, when is Tanker 3 supposed to go into production? Tanker 3 is out, my friend. Tanker 3 has been out for a while. That was the one that showed up March of 2020 when COVID showed up. That's the reprint volume. So that one's available. That one's current, ready to go. Tanker 3 and 4 are in stock, been in stock for a year. So that one is there. It's Tanker 1 and 2 are being reprinted. Um, all the SM books are re Oh, I have a little bit of the fish sub left. So that's the last reprint to do. But 2 and 3 are being reprinted as we speak. Tanker 1 as we speak. Those will be here in a few weeks. And then Tanker 2 reprint with the SM4 brand new book coming in October is the ones that the files are ready, like they're the ones next. And that was a paper delay that we're having some cover stock issues with the paper. So if you're familiar with my small books, these guys, and because so many of the books in the RSP line are going to be covered with the stock, I did not want to change it. I really didn't. Um, we call this in, in the United States a linen stock paper cover. You can see there's a fabric texture to that. I love it, I absolutely love it. This is a personal thing for me as a company owner. I have a reference book that's that was this size. Um, it's an old, it's an old photo file, F-O-T-O-F-I-L-E. -F I think it's German, German publication called Photo File from the 60s. And it's this size, it's like six and a half by seven and a half. And, um, but the weight of it is perfect for shipping. And of course we can, you know, Picture size is not a problem, my friends. <laughs> let, let me just tell you right now, because what I did, at least I think I was smart with what I did, was I used the whole page as, as like basically a full photo layout versus breaking them up. There is a few points where we get, a, you know, we'll get some smaller photos, you know, half a page photo. You know, some of these here will get a little bit smaller, but those are still quite large enough. You know, that's, that's a that's a that's almost one to one. In fact, that's about the same size as the Sosby Lake. So I try to break up the SM books, not to be a bookseller right now, but I need to be. <laughs> um, but that linen cover stock, this paper stock, this this paper right here is is hard to find in Europe because of all the COVID bullshit of shippers. The whole conversation with with moving stuff around. Um, in Europe, they call it a slightly different uh, paper stock, but there's limited supplies of it in that colorway. And I need it to be that white color. There were some other colors available and I was like, I'm not putting a color on my, on my thing, on my Jimmy Jams. So I had to stick to my guns on that. We're already late, fuck it, what's another couple of weeks? So anyway, she's working with me on that, but we'll, cause I gotta do technique guides. All the small books will have the linen paper stock. Yeah. Um, 
one quality that. thank you yeah i like sm3 it's it's so when i started with one this is a nice segue too when i started with one it was a new book for me because i'd done four tank arts and then sm1 was its own thing and i was like okay and i worked it through and then in sm2 things started to click like oh i can do this i can do this i can oh i don't need to cut it off at 90 some pages or whatever i can just keep making pages uh, and then SM03 is, is the, the finalization of what the SM books will be like in terms of the conversation, how it flowed, the graphics, all of it. It all like you if you have one, two and three, you can really see an intimate progression of my thinking of how what was going on with it. So, like the, the OPR pages in SM3 were really a development of what I talked about in, in one, how I photographed it. And then in two, I kind of improved it. And then three, I was like, you know, F this. Like the streams, like I, I want to show you guys so much the brushwork. And if you look at three, those pages I just showed you of the, of the actual brushwork on the legs, I took a brush stroke and a photo, brush stroke and a photo. And I went through like just hundreds of them. And I put like, you know, half of them in the book for the reasons of what, it, you know, this is before the video. So just kind of doing that. So hopefully that, that, that resonates. That's what I'm talking about, my friends. So I'm gonna finish this little hazy heat discoloration with kind of a gold tone. I think that's kind of the final shade, right? It kind of goes blue to purples to reds into the, into the golds and oranges a little bit. And this is where these King Art colors are probably gonna come in there. They're a little bit muted, which is what we want though. We don't want full blown 100% opacity. Yeah, so that was that's for me as the, as the graphic designer guy. That's a, that was kind of an important step. Yeah, and that's actually what led me to, to really want to do the technique guides, because I think the technique guides will be kind of the the visualization of what you guys are seeing through the through this live streaming. That'll be kind of when those come out. You guys are it'll really start to click. So I'm I'm excited for that. I know it's a little bit behind schedule, but I'm I'm actually really excited for all that. Which means I think next year will be a lot of fun. I think we'll have the videos down pat, we'll have the books down pat, and I think we'll be able to just start humming through a lot of different stuff. I think that's gonna be a good, good times. Good times are coming. So I'm just kind of carefully drawing. I don't wanna go too powerful with this yellow. Kind of gold yellow tone. Just, just a little bit of a smidge. Probably a little bit too much. Yeah, it's a little too much. Little too much. Nothing a little blending with dinners won't fix. Now I appreciate everybody hanging out too. This is I know it's been kind of a a light hearted stream today for me, but yellow is a little too strong. So if that yellow is a little too strong, and that's yellow can do that. Let's go back to a little bit more of a reddish, warm purple, and we'll go right back over that between the blue and the yellow, kind of bring in that reddish tone a little bit. We're missing kind of a layer. But remember, this is one 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 forty four scale, so I don't want to go too nuts. I'll probably I'll probably knock it down one more level. Because I got to kind of work all these colors back in a little bit. It's a little bit of a it's a very unique situation. This is this is miniature fantasy painting modeling right now. <laughs> Haven't really done a lot of that, my friends. So anytime you have the paint not really coming off the paintbrush, get a little bit more thin around there. Minimum. 
be surprised how that little that little gentle tap there it goes that's actually not half bad that actually looks like one of those oily little prism that actually there we go all right i pulled <laughs> pulled out of the dive <laughs> wasn't quite sure if i was gonna pull this one on <laughs> okay i think i'm pulling i think i pulled that out it actually looks from certain angles that actually came out okay so what i'm gonna do now is I'm gonna build up a little bit more of an actual shape to that. So I gotta put some more of that white oxidation-ish gray tone up to that yellow, just to kind of, but that, that's there, so that works. That gives me a little bit of, so I just need to build up a little bit right in here, kind of repair that a little bit and, and come back with some of that. I can clean this up a little bit. It doesn't have to be super, super sharp edge, a um, little bit overlaps fine. But I'm gonna be able now I can come in and fix and finish all this off. You can see I kind of intentionally, intentionally. And that's okay, because these are the kind of pieces you learn with too. You know, kind of this this oxidized almost gives you the ribbed bladed edge look to that a little bit. And I've got to come in and do a little bit more work here. So that's actually that's actually coming along pretty good. Where are we at? We're at six? Okay, we're almost at three. Um, Marino, this brush was, like I said, this when I reset this a few minutes ago, um, this is probably 97.2% dry. Uh, do you think the King Art Oils compare to that? So right now, I see no quality difference between the two brands, which is good. That's what you want to see. You don't want to see. Um, they promote their oils as a really creamy. Um, yeah, they, they're saying it's, so they're actually on the, on the box. They're saying thick, creamy. <laughs> Kind of like, uh, yeah, keep it PG. That's a thick, creamy finish, non-toxic, fast drying, artist quality. So that's what they're promotional as on the, their text on the on the thing. Let's just read the verbiage on the back. Cause I think it's, it's their conversation holds true. And every everything I've talked to with them, they seem a very straightforward company, which I like. Excuse me, <clears throat> hiccups. Okay, so. As you can see here, we use pure pigments in our pro level oil paint, ensuring clean, bright colors that mix brilliantly. The range of colors you can create is practically unlimited, which is why we like OPR so much, right? This holds true, um, so I'm on board. And the paint's consistent quality gives you the precise control you need to produce stunning results. Uh, yeah. The buttery texture, and that's what I'm seeing. It's a, it's a creamy paint. What they're talking about in terms of, um, let's pull this off the table here. What I'm seeing up close, Oops, I just stuck my finger in that real good too. Again, I just put these down just to see how they're going. But one thing I, I will say, where's my... Subaru's driving around. If you guys know a Subaru exhaust, that's what you're hearing. It's that flat four turbo unequal length exhaust pipes. They're annoying. <laughs> and I'm old now, I'm old and crotchety. Be like, dudes, what are you doing? Okay, so... Let me make sure. Let me do it this way because there's no oils. I can hold this. Okay, to the creamiest part, what happened? What we're talking about is, see how that just pushes in real nice. You can see the butter. It looks like butter. So that's the, I like that. What I find though is that okay, we should be fair. These are brand new oil tubes. Some of these tubes of oils over here, truthfully told, are from 07, 20, 2010. Uh, these are dried up pretty good now. Yeah, they're. I mean, I can punch through them but they get a little bit more cakey. And that happens because these are probably a little bit on the older side. Um, so that just shows you, I'm fine with them. I'm, I think they, they're at least uh, in terms of color to color, one to one. Uh, I'm not seeing any drop off in performance. Uh, the blending, the sh everything I did, I have that model now. So if we look at this one, cause I did the bulk of the work with it on this guy. And I don't think you guys can tell. And if I, you didn't know, you wouldn't know. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying, boys? So this is all 502, all 502. Uh, the, the King Art stuff was, um, where did it, it's all, it's all from here over, it was all King Art oils over here. So I, I, you know, there is some overlap through this just to kind of blend the colors up. This is all King Art back here. But even these tones here with these tones and the blending, the, the type, like if, if I'm seeing pigments or the granules or the grains, then we got a problem and we're not. So it is a true artist level. The, the student stuff, who, who wrote me in, about student? Was it somebody, somebody wrote me about Junin, but that's uh, um, do you think the, the, the King Art tubes would harden faster? Um, probably not because these are, these are metal tubes with the art, like all these art brand caps, cause even, even the other stuff. So here, let's just pop this open. Let's, let's do a quick, 
run through with these guys again. This is just because it's it's just fun. You guys probably haven't really spent a ton of time doing this kind of stuff. So one thing I liked about them, okay, so each each cap has the um, when you open these up. So this has got this is sealed. The metal is sealed across when you open it. So there's a, there's a, like an aluminum seal over that, and they use this punch. The one thing I like about that now is I know that that cap goes with this guy. And then what I'm able to do is, uh, this is a little bit more precise opening for me compared to the 502s a little bit. And the 502 is a little bit older. Um, that's no big deal. It just, as two oils get older, but these are the same metal quality. There's nothing, the 502s are the same way. In fact, the 502s are drying up too. So it's, it's nothing to do with anything. Um, the, the, the only ones that were plastic were the wilder ones. So these are all, in, fa in fact, as far as I know, this is your standard industry standard art level of quality in terms of uh, tube of oil paint. They do dent, like you fart on these the wrong way and they just dent, so you can't keep them pristine. But I am gonna try my best. Uh, I don't think there'll be any difference in the length of um, time. I'm not seeing any kind of dryness in the oil paints to let me think that they have less linseed oil that they would dry out faster, so no. And I've never known an oil paint to be a fast drying oil paint outside of the Wilder conversation because they intentionally split the linseed in the, in the pigments. And I think they were doing that to be like a faster drying on the weather inside of life. So I think these would act just like 502s. I'm not seeing anything in these that would say, no, they're not gonna be the same durability as, as Windsor Newton to just smaller. Now, the reason I like the 12 mils, and I will sit here, let's pull these things out. Okay, so we got these dudes here, which I still can have and use and have access to. This is not a problem. I'm not, this is not a, a this is not one's better than the other. This is just, it's a, it's a new supplier in terms of that conversation. So this is a 37 mil tube, uh, Windsor Newtons. So there's 37 mil. Uh, I bought this, I use this at Art Center. So I've had these since the late nineties. Cause I know I was, uh, let's say probably 2002, 2003. I started in 97, but I started using oils right after that, a couple years after that. So, you know, call them 20 years old, 25 years old, somewhere in that ballpark. They're still going strong, as, as many artists will, will use tubes of oils for decades. So these are the 502s. <laughs> Picked up the messy one for you. Uh, they're in a metal, same thing. Um, they do, they did, I do notice a leakage of them, and they, oftentimes they all tend to leak out of this, so I'll notice this eventually. It'll probably start happening. Uh, well, they'll start to bleed out through the metal. Because it's not a welded seal, it's like a toothpaste, it's not crimped like a toothpaste, like a toothpaste tube. Anyway, this is and this is a plastic cap. Same same thing. I don't expect it to be much different. These are 20 milliliters, so these are slightly bigger than the 12 milliliters. And these are, I got these from Miguel, 2007, 2008. So that's how old these guys are. Most of them, I, I, I did run out of shadow brown, um, and then the, some of the blues and greens were newer releases. The primer red was a newer release, so a little bit younger oils, but not by much. So that's that. Um, and I do like these come in a nice case. I'll try to keep them pristine and clean because I'm OCD anyway. Um, I will do, uh, my friend Ilya Ute, uh, a Russian friend, uh, we were talking offline. I will do a travel stream, like um, a good thing to take with you if you guys want to, you know, um, yeah, Silver 252. I, I have the original I have the original box. Like I think I've told you that, guys, that story where uh, when Adam was still at MIG Productions and, and it was, we were all at Euro Militaire and we were the Sunday night of closing down the show. And you know how shows go at the end where we're just, I don't want to take this home. And MIG just had that box. He goes, here, you take them. Like, okay. Yeah, go spend time with the wife. Don't get a divorce, Joe. Uh, we covered some ground today. Uh, good information on all the, 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 the thing, the, the oils and, and actually just that little bit of work there too. That actually, I'm actually quite happy with that. That's a, that's got that that vibe that that looks like that was from a distance it catches your eyes like ooh a little bit of a, a little bit of heat I'll, I'll continue on with that but we've got the stug pretty far along um, oh what else my eyes are starting to go I need to eat dinner anyway I wonder the linseed and pigment ratio you know I don't know I would be I'd love to have a chemical conversation with some of these guys at, at a deeper level it'd be interesting who knows who knows where this will go um, no promises, no nothing. Just letting you know that you know these came in. This is was a thank you, uh, but again, that thank you I think resonates to you guys because uh, you're the support leg of all of this, whatever it is. You know, I'm just I'm just having a good time. I'm just painting models. 
<clears throat> but I do like the 12 mil size because I think that'll give you a good two, three years per tube of color. You know, maybe whites and blacks go faster, but that's normal. And I'm sure by then they'll have uh, individuals to buy. They did send me a box of their 20, of, I did, they didn't know oh, it's a 37 mils. So they sent me the box of 12 and then they have a box of 10, 37 mils. I didn't even open it. Cause that's just, I'm just like, these are huge. But I think these sell for 20, 30 bucks. I don't think the, this is just a bigger size. It's the same thing. It's just less colors. Um, but it was the it's just the bigger the bigger tubes. These are the professional or the and they're this size because two day canvas dudes use a lot of oils. We don't. We wouldn't need to. Uh, so I do like the 12 mil. 12 mils are on point. Um, what else we got? Uh, how did you first start scale modeling, Mike? Uh, my dad in the 70s. Uh, you're welcome, uh, Vivian. I hope it was entertaining. <laughs> <Some> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I mean, two things that Miguel had done um, in my regard specifically was he told me after color modulation, when Adam had left, he said, you need a definitive technique. So I took what I was trying to do and I broke down my weathering and go, what, what is it that I do? And it was the oil paints. And then I was like, I developed it into it. The first uh, articles on missing links, you guys can probably Google that in and find it. It's up in there. That's how that happened. It was a conversation with Miguel. Um, but I was already using oils to a big extent on Missing Link's website. We were, we were sharing our work all over the place. And then like 03, 04, 05, you know, we're all, everybody was kind of becoming friends at that time. All the, the, the like, I don't want to say the heavy hitters, but all of us that kind of were doing this armor thing seriously, you know, on a professional level, kind of like Adam and Mig and, and those guys. And so we, you know, Euro Military was the, was the cornerstone show. And that's, it was the Olympics. I always call it like that, but yeah. That's where it was. Uh, question, graphite, standard number two uses, uh, number two is fine, you can use, you know, where's my tax pencil? Here's my, this is my 1040, my 1040 Ticonderogas, dude. These are the best, the best of the best. Best of the best, sir. Any number two will work. Any HB number twos, uh, any on the, on the, is it the Bs or the softer side? Hs are the harder side. Go in more of the B level if you're buying pencils. Uh, they do have a pencil set. I actually, I, I bought, um, so I bought the t-shirt yesterday. So the package showed up. Cool, thank you guys. Put a new order into them and said, hey, uh, grab the t-shirt. And then I bought the um, their watercolor pencil set. So let's we'll play around with those. I, I've, I've paid attention to the watercolor pencil conversation. So we'll see. I think there's some things we might be able to even do with that. So we'll see if it, if it has any promise for, for the way I do things. Um, it was for 20 bucks, whatever. It's like 70 pencils. Uh, and I do want to start drawing again, just on my own, just as, a, as an artist. Um, and so I, they do have a, a graphite pencil set as well that I want to get. Um, but yeah, let me see what else. But yeah, so anyway, the tube at 12 millimeters, milliliters, sorry, 12 mil, 12 mil as I say. Um, there plenty, there's plenty of oils to last, dude. I'd be surprised. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna conservatively estimate three years each on each of those tubes. So what else? Anything else, guys? Everybody good? Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Um, really good chat. Uh, obviously, a lot of stuff to cover. How do you find the King Art? Uh, all the, yeah, Zell, sorry, I didn't see that question. Um, all the links are in the description below. I've actually linked this box for you guys. So you can go grab them. And I would say, go back through the stream if you want to pick up some additional specialty brushes. Um, I hit home on the ones that will work for what we're doing in the sizes that we're doing. So I put those all in the stream in the first hour. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you, Marino. Yeah. I like the fish sub too. Uh, it's funny because the, the books I have sold out of, I've got like 40 left, so it's sold out basically. But, um, and then the fish submarine is kind of that, it was a really old resin project in it, but it's the first of the series. And I, and I, I learned so much just as a production artist about what to do with it and, and how to make it stuff. Um, I could see you in the Hamptons OPR, the rich. <laughs> I tell you what, that you know who I'm living next to. I'm going to live next next to Martha Stewart. If I ever, if this ever happens, Matt, 58. Hey, James Lynn, how are you? I didn't see your name there. Uh, the, the Crocodile Dundee knife quote. Yeah, they've been running Crocodile Dundee on net, on all the channels lately. I'm living next to Martha Stewart. That bitch is the baddest ass mofo on planet Earth. She is the coolest. When I moved to port uh, to this building here, we didn't have. Uh, internet the first two months as they were finishing the building off. I was one of the first guys here. So I had to like old school the TV it. And so I was watching old reruns of Martha Stewart in her shows. The stuff she does is just, ins I love it, dude. It's so cool. But she just, she figured out like what we're, this is so funny because what I'm doing is a cooking show and they figured it all out. Emerald, 
Martha, all that, all those, I was watching all that old, because I like the food stuff, and they got a sweet tooth, so I'm watching all those things. I didn't have any other TV to watch, though. You know, I'm not watching Channel 2 News, CBS News at night, it's just depressing. <laughs> so I was watching Emerald, and Emerald Lagasse shows and, and old Martha Stewart shows. Badasses. They did the old school way. Um, but yeah, every, any other questions, any final thoughts? Everybody good? You guys are awesome. I appreciate the support. Uh, good stream. I'll see you Sunday. Expect a winter track road wheel snow. Fingers crossed. We should have the products in by then. They should be here by then. <laughs> we be pissed otherwise. Uh, you're welcome, Robert. Thanks for staying in there, man. Poland. Poland. Are, you guys are the best, dude. You guys are awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. I'm out of here. I'm going to go eat. Uh, everybody have a good rest of your Wednesday slash Thursday. Uh, all my Kiwi boys, everybody have a good day. Uh, Gumpla Ronum, hey, I saw you there. Stop by to say hi. You just check out, just making sure I got everybody's name. Just scrolling up through. Okay. Catch you all later. See you guys.